Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Praise Yahweh for another wonderful Shabbat. It's always wonderful. And uh, but fresh this morning. It's been a nice chilly week. But we praise our Master that we're all here and we can be in His Word, giving praise to Him and rejoicing in Him. And Shalom to our Covenant family online. Always good to see our Master joining us according to His perfect design. So, uh, another week. And we are continuing our journey in Shemot as Yisrael are leaving Mitzrayim. And so we're carrying on from chapter 13, verse 17 through to 17, verse 16 today. Then we'll be looking at the prophets and uh, then we'll be going to Matthew 5. So Ricardo's ready for us. Oh, you, uh, oh no, Henry. Wow. This, uh, yeah, okay, you're going to read chapter 14 as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's rethink the starting lap. <laughs> okay, okay, no, we'll, we'll, we'll give it to you, Henry. Chapter 13, verse 17. Okay. And it came to be when Pharaoh had let the people go, that Elihim did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines. Through that was nearer, for Elihim said, lest the people regret when when they see fighting and return to Mitzrayim. So Elihim led the people around the way of the wilderness of the Sea of Reeds. And the children of Israel went up in fives from the land of Mitzrayim. And Moshe took the bones of Yosef with him, for he certainly made the children of Israel swear, saying, Elihim shall certainly visit you, and you shall bring my bones from here with you. And they departed from Sukkot, Sukkot and camped at Etham, at the edge of the wilderness. And Yahweh went before them by day in a column of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a column of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. The column of cloud did not cease by, no by day, nor the column of by fire by night before the people. Okay, so this week's Torah portion is called Beshalach, and it's when he sent, and it comes from the root word Shalach, which means to send, bid farewell, put forth, or it can also mean urgently send. So Pharaoh certainly wasn't bidding farewell to Israel. He was driving them out, urgently sending them away. And when he drove them out after the death of the firstborn, we can see here a powerful picture right at the beginning of this Torah portion when it says that Pharaoh let the people go and Elohim didn't let them go on the short route. And there's a good reason for that, because we are told that if they encountered fighting along the way, they would have been inclined to go back to Mitzrayim. You know, and so when, when one discovers a lot of the archaeological discoveries that have been done, when one sees, discovers the discoveries, yeah, um, we can see how they've managed to source various Mitzrian outposts, the military outposts that were along this shorter route. So it would have made sense for Pharaoh to send ahead a messenger to these various outposts to threaten Israel and capture them again and bring them back, because that, after all, is what Pharaoh desired. He realized, hey, my slave labor's gone. I want them back, you know. And so Israel were slaves. They were bricklayers fetching their own straw because they didn't get straw and that, you know, and they were enslaved for many years under the oppression of Mitzrayim and certainly weren't people that were taught in the Mitzrayim military how to fight. And so they were going to find themselves in the flesh much weaker than the biggest military force in the world at that stage, you know. And so it's a great encouragement for us to see how Yahweh protects his bride. You know, and so in terms of the betrothal, we also see in Devarim the instruction that's given out that when a man has taken a new wife, don't let him go out to the army for a year. You know, he was kind of so that he can, you know, be exempt for one year for the sake of his home, to rejoice with his wife that he's taken. And so we can see this is shadow picture here in a sense that Yahweh was indeed protecting his bride from fighting battles immediately. I mean, he was, they were going to get to Mount Sinai, they were going to enter into a marriage covenant, but his loving commitment to these covenants of promise that he made with Abraham and uh, uh, with Yitzchak and Yaakov, he was certainly delivering his bride-to-be. 
and wasn't going to impose on her that fighting straight away. They would learn how to fight and Yahweh would give them certain clear tests to learn how to fight so when they get into the promised land, they could drive out the nations that they were equipped to drive out, you know. And so one of the assurances that we get as we read this Torah portion in the next chapter is that Yahweh fights for us. And so they would have been armed by belief going out. And here was a nation that was delivered by the mighty hand of Yahweh. And yet Yahweh knew that if they encountered any threat along the way, just coming out, it would cause them to turn back. And so this in itself carries a wonderful lesson for us in a teaching that there's no quick ways or shortcuts in following Yahweh, His way. You know, and obeying the commands of Elohim. We've all come out of Mitzrayim, so to speak, or come out of Babylon, whichever way you want to interpret it. They both carry various insights and meanings on a practical level from what we've come out of in terms of fleshly ways, corrupt worship system, which is according to the flesh. And we realize that sometimes when we, we understand that coming out of these systems, our journey might take a little bit longer than we expect before we get the full understanding of why we're on this journey. You know, and it's for our own good that this takes time. Even when the nations were asking in Acts 15, what do we need to do? And they were told, go every week, stop the corrupt worship, get out of that immediately. You'll do well to start there. Stop all the corrupt worship and go every Sabbath where Moshe is read. You know, because then you will grow. And you will learn how to put on the armor of Elohim. You'll learn how to stand and fight the good fight of the belief. And so we have to be constantly on guard against the inclination of turning back to old ways. In Hebrews, we see towards the end of the book of Hebrews, it, it, we're clearly told that we are not those who shrink back, but we press on. Because Yahweh takes no pleasure in those who shrink back. You know, if you put your hand to the plow and you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom. So here was a clear assurance of Yahweh that he was going to take Israel. He took Israel another way to make sure that they wouldn't shrink back, look back, fall back, be inclined to go back. Although we see many lessons that we can learn on their journey where a lot of rebellion had to be sorted out and grumbling, you know. And so Yahweh let them go the long route. And he says there in case they would regret after having come out. Now, the Hebrew word regret is nacham, which means to comfort, console, be comforted, but it can also mean to be sorry, um, suffer grief, repent. It's written in the form that can be rendered as being sorry or suffer grief. So he brought them the long way so that they wouldn't suffer grief. Yahweh didn't want them to suffer. He didn't want them to go, oh, we've just come out. Now we're going to fight. Let's just go back to what we know. He didn't want that to happen. You know, and a lot of people like to take shortcuts in life. You know, they, they, they often try and do the quick fix, the quick thing to get to a solution, thinking, I don't want to have to go through all this long way round, but they don't realize that quick fixes end up costing you more, you know. And so many a times we might have seen how coming out of corrupt systems of worship, whether it's been many years ago, whether it's recently, that... People are often overwhelmed by the real, realization of inherited lies. And, and quite frankly, I think that a lot of people that come out and start walking on this walk, guarding the Sabbaths and trying to understand, actually only down the road do they realize some of the inherited lies. A lot of times they're not actually owning up to the realization what they were doing was wrong. They just think, okay, I know this is right, but they don't actually realize what was wrong. And so sometimes the realization of inherited lies and the inability to face those things with the proper equipping of the truth and how to answer it, battles come around and it causes a bit of panic in some people's lives that they end up turning back to what they've been comfortable with so they don't have to fight. <laughs> I don't want to have to keep fighting and telling people why I'm not doing that anymore and why I'm doing this. So they resort back to what's comfortable in the flesh and almost keeping relationships, what they think need to be kept as intact, you know, and so people are unable to fight the good fight due to the lack of knowledge in the truth, and they're unwilling to actually take time learning that truth and getting equipped. We're told here that Israel went up in fives in verse 15, and the Hebrew word for fives, some translations say they went up armed. It comes from the word chamushim, which means in battle array or military formation, and it's very powerful for us, this picture. 
because it signifies for us that they came out in an orderly manner. It wasn't chaos. It wasn't Pharaoh driving them out. Now, everybody, it's like a, a mass riot and, and people just trying to escape the, you know, whether it's a fire or an earthquake, whatever. You see these movies and everybody's just running in panic. This wasn't Israel. They were coming out in an orderly, functional manner, you know, according to the instructions, guided under the authority of the instructions of Elohim as given through Moshe, and there was no chaos at all. And I'll, I'll, we must make it clear here that this highlights for us a powerful witness of the perfect order of our master in Elohim in walking according to the Torah. And we can't have a situation where everyone is doing whatever is right in their own eyes because that causes more division, more hurt, more regrets, you know, more falling away. And there's order when we come out of enslavement to corrupt ways. There's an order that Yahweh, but we don't come out to, hey, I'm now free of the corruption, now I can do what I like. Just because we've been released from slavery of man's institutionalized religion, it doesn't give us a license to be lawless. It actually gives us the green light to now be law-abiding citizens of the reign of the heavens, as given through Moshe. And so on the contrary, we have a defined set of instructions and laws that we go through every week to be reminded of, of who we are as a people that are seated with Messiah in the heavenlies. And we realize that we have been given these laws, these instructions, these right rulings, these uh, um, precepts for our good, to identify us as a set-apart people that our master is coming for as a ready bride. Now, the reason for translating it as fives is because it's, a, a, it's closely linked to a word, the Hebrew word chamisha, which means fives or multiple of fives, multiples of fives or, or fifth. And coming out in fives carries a nice picture for us in many ways as we understand the, the complete word in our master. We, we see that the first five books of scripture are that of Moshe, giving us a clear witness of the instructions of Yahweh, how we are to walk in, in the commands, guard the commands, and not look to the left or to the right, but meditate on the very Torah of our master day and night as given through Moshe. And it gives us a clear light for our path. And it gives us a description of a redemption of the firstborn. And we also see through this that the, the firstborn redemption price was five shekels of silver. So we see this kind of number of five playing a, a powerful witness for us of the order of our master. And thinking about this, we also see that it's being delivered and set free from Mitzrayim and the bondage to sin and lawlessness comes with the responsibility of walking according to Yahweh's Torah. You don't get set free to now... Do what you like. You've been bought at a price. You're no longer your own. You belong to Messiah. And as members of the household of Messiah, which we were once not, we now have a responsibility to obey the rules of the house. And Yahweh has made it very clear, his rules, his house, his ways. There is only one way, and that's the way of set apartness that he prescribes for us through the Torah. What's also a powerful picture is when Shaul gives us a clear witness in Ephesians of the five um, offices or five gifts or five appointments that our master appoints to equip the body to maturity. Again, we are seeing a pattern of order in the master. It's not everybody is appointed to teach, everybody's appointed to evangelize, everybody's appointed to be a prophet. We should all prophesy for the upbuilding of the body. That's what Shaul was saying, I desire you all prophesy. You know, when he was explaining why it shouldn't be chaotic with many tongues going and everybody chaotic situations, that was the context. There. He says, I want you to build each other up. But the office of a prophet is to call people back to the Torah and warn them what will happen if they don't. So the difference between prophecy and the office of a prophet, you know, and these are given by our master, appointed in the body to make sure that the body grows up, lacks nothing into, and grows up to the maturity of Messiah uh, as our head, in, as his body, so that we know how to actually walk in obedience and in the proper order of our master, you know. So a derivative of the word in Hebrew that's used for fives is another word that's very closely related to being um, armed for battle or being set in a 
formation to fight the good fight of the belief, so to speak, and that is the Hebrew word chamim, ch chamish shim, which means 50, multiples of 50, 50s or 50th, so you got chamisha, which is five, you got chamishim, which is battle array, you got chamishim, chamishishim, yeah, um, chamish shim, sorry, which is 50, so you get this multiple. So one of the things that we see here is the number of 50 in, in, in Hebrew, we also understand carries valuable insight for us, especially as we consider the season of counting to Shavuot, you know, and counting uh, seven completed Sabbaths. And on the 50th day, we, we gather on Shavu, uh, for Shavuot and we are reminded that we were slaves in Mitzrayim. So the counting to 50 reminds us of how we came out, what we were delivered from. And knowing that now we have been delivered from slavery, we have an order to follow to be a prepared bride that will be met by her husband at Sukkot when he comes to fetch his bride for Yom on Yom Kippur to take her with him, to boot with him forever, as the awakening sound of Yom Teruah reminds us that we are betrothed. So we see this continual picture of remembrance, that remembrance is is. Wonderful for us to understand what are we to remember. Number one, we're to remember that we're betrothed. We're to remember that we once were slaves. And in remembering that, we remember an order that we are to follow. So that we do not forget to guard the commands of our master. It's by the blood of Messiah that we've been redeemed. And we've been redeemed from enslavement to wrong ways. And therefore, we have a responsibility to be dressed in the complete armor of our master clothed in righteousness, which is to guard his commands and keeping our garments clean, you know. And so we see a, a wonderful lesson here of putting on Messiah, putting on the master. But in order to properly put on the master, we must put off the false so that we're not found to be wolves in sheep's clothing, so to speak. And so one of the things that we can tie in very clearly in our uh, um lesson of putting on the master is that which Shaul gives us in Ephesians when he talks about putting on the armor of Elohim. You can look at the notes for a bit more insight. I've gone into depth with that. I'm not going to speak on it now, but just reminding you that the belt of truth, you know, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of deliverance, the shield of belief, the sword of the spirit, shoes of peace. And when we relate these elements of the armor of Elohim that we are to put on and stand and after having done all, keep standing, we realize it's very closely linked to the very garments of the high priest in the service of the tabernacle. And so it's a clear witness of staying in the master, standing firm on the truth, the rock of our deliverance, and lifting up the, the sword, which is the only offensive weapon that we have, but lifting up the shield of belief and using the sword to rightly divide so that we can be built up in the belief and stop those fiery darts of the enemy from getting in and trying to disrupt our confirmation of who we are as a delivered people. So we guard our hearts and minds in the master through righteousness and the deliverance that he's given us. So then we come back to this, and in verse 19, we're told here that Moshe took the bones of Yosef. Yosef made Israel swear that they would take his bones up. You know, and that Yahweh would visit them and he should, they should take his bones with them up from Mitzrayim to the promised land. And this is a powerful picture here. This is 400 years later, 430 years later, a little bit under 400 because Israel were in Mitzrayim for 430 years and Yosef still lived a little while. So just under 400 years, his bones were waiting to be taken up by a delivered people. And so Moshe, in literally bringing Yosef's bones up at this time, is a great prophetic significance for us today as we understand that Moshe, in, in the renewed writings, is a picture for the Torah for us. You know, go every week where Moshe is read and how it's the very Torah of Yahweh that brings the unified body of, in, in, as a shadow picture of Yosef being a shadow picture of Messiah to the promised land as promised by Yahweh. We get a picture of this when we read Yechezkiel 37 about prophesying to the bones, you know, and how these bones come together, you know, and, and there's a shaking and there's a rattling. And then he prophesies to the spirit and then these bodies receive the spirit and they get up and here's a large multitude. Here's a picture of the resurrection power of Messiah bringing his bride back. 
showing a clear witness that Yahweh knows those who are his, and the confirmation of a resurrection promise to those who have been in Messiah at the first resurrection, where the second death has no power over them, you know. So they departed from Sukkot and they went to Atham. And so on our journey, it's great importance for us to understand some of these routes. When we get to Bamidbar, we're going to summarize the 42 starting points or departure points uh, as a relation to how we learn to walk in the wilderness, so to speak, as we are sojourning here as foreigners in the world, when our master will come to get a ready people who have obeyed his voice, not like our fathers in the wilderness who disobeyed and did not enter in. So when we look at this, when we look at Sukkot and Atham, we learn some wonderful lessons. Sukkot, we know, means booths and carries the idea of a temporary dwelling. Now, Sukkot, in terms of a geological uh, uh, marking, it was still in Mitzrayim. And so Sukkot, we know, is a reference to the festival of booths, the, the seventh feast of our master, which highlights a, a, a celebratory remembrance of that which is still to come when our master will make his booth with us to be with us forever. And so every year we remember also these wilderness journeys because we stay in tents because we remember our fathers were in tents for 40 years in the wilderness. So we stay in tents for eight days. Sometimes we stretch it to a few more. So this year we're going to have 10 or so days. We're still looking for a site. I've been searching high and low. There was another possible site that's an hour and a bit away, but we're still looking at that. But keep us in prayer. And anybody comes up with some good ideas, we're open for inspections you know, to go and search out good spots for Sukkot this year. But anyway, coming back to what it means for us in terms of our journey in the Master being delivered from captivity of sin and lawlessness, this city, as I said, was in Mitzrayim. It reminds us that we are still in the world, but we are not of the world, as our Master prayed in Yochanan 17, that he didn't pray that we are taken out of the world, but that we are guarded from the evil one in the world. And so therefore we come to our master and we realize that Sukkot, we learn to camp out, so to speak, in a territory that is occupied by a people that aren't of Yahweh. So we are temporary dwellers here on earth. And it was here at Sukkot where we see in this chapter from Shemot 13, the regulations for the firstborn males are given as well. When you start, we ended last week's Torah portion looking at the regulation for firstborn males. But in Chazon 12, we also see a parallel picture of the woman bearing a male child who would shepherd all the nations with a rod of iron. So our first stop at coming out of Mitzrayim, coming out of captivity, coming out of false religious systems, is the clear fact of beginning to keep his Sabbaths and his feasts entering his rest every week as, we, as a community that's sojourning together. And the sad reality is there are many people who claim that they've left Ramesses. Remember last week we looked at Ground Zero and Ramesses, child of the sun, and yet the comfort of inherited lives is still too hard for them to let go, simply because they refuse to acknowledge the true Sabbath of Yahweh and the importance of the Sabbath. There are people that have been claiming to be on this walk for many years, yet are still compromising the Sabbath because they don't see the vital importance that begins our journey. If you can't get that right at the beginning, you're going to be taking shortcuts with every other aspect and regulations and rules and house rules of the master. You know, if people compromise, they can be on this walk for many years, but if they compromise the Sabbath for business, for relationships, for whatever else it is, Believe you me, they're compromising other areas of their life. Because if you don't start to get the Sabbath set apart, you will never really learn what true set-apartness is about because you'll never have ears to hear what you should be hearing on the Sabbath. That the Spirit would then bring further insight and understanding and wisdom, you know. What we must realize is that this comes down to worship. Many people, having been indoctrinated for centuries, well, Maybe you're not a century old, but for many years, decades, they refuse the truth for a twisted lie that claims 
The Sabbath changed. Many people, I mean, it's centuries that they've been promoting this, but we, but many people have realized it's wrong, but come out and they realize, hold on, there's a whole set of new rules and regulations that I must follow. Uh, this isn't for me. Let me go what I like. Sukkot, we know, as I said, is the seventh feast of Yahweh, and we understand the importance as the shadow picture of rehearsing the seventh day of Yahweh every week reminds us of the seven appointed times, the feasts of Yahweh, that we are to celebrate as festivals unto him. And these mark us. The Sabbath, last week we looked at Pesach and Matzot being a mark on our hands and as frontlets between our eyes. We also see a clear witness in Yechezkel that the Sabbaths are given to us. Vayikra says, these are my Sabbaths, and it lays out the appointed times of Yahweh. So the Sabbath and feasts of Yahweh is the mark on our hand and forehead. And when we disregard or take off that mark, for the sake of the flesh and compromise with other ways or people, we re, we're actually relinquishing our identity in Messiah. You know? And so it's that Sukkot stop, in a sense, where we learn to rest in him and allow his word to give us the necessary shalom and strength to sojourn as we should. So we move on from calling upon his name, receiving the sign of our worship by keeping his Sabbath, you know, and so we understand how important it is. These first two stations, we looked last week at Ramesses coming to Sukkot, th that is a clear beginning of our journey. It teaches us the, the keys of understanding our starting point in walking in the Master as we learn that this isn't the, e this isn't the end, this is just the beginning, discovering his name and the importance of Sabbath that marks us so that we can have his name upon us as identified as his bride. And so Sukkot teaches us valuable lessons of the first, of the first stop in, in, in Mitzrayim, leaving from Ramesses to the first stop Sukkot, but yet Sukkot's the last feast. So here we have the first and the last principle again. If you don't start out right, you will not end right. It makes sense? They then came to Atham. Atham means with them or their plowshare. And in the understanding of with them, we tied in once again with the revelation of Yeshua Messiah that Yochanan was given in chapter 12, where Satan is cast out of heaven down to earth, where he dwells with man. So now Satan is with them, the inhabitants of the earth. You know? And here it's where he sets up his corrupt government control through the beast. Etham deals with sin. The stop. Etham helps us realize in our journey. We understand, we call upon the name of Yahweh. We realize the need to guard his Sabbath. And then the realization of how Yahweh is with us by his spirit teaches us that we now need to deal with sin. We must look intently into the mirror of the word and we must know what we should look like so that we don't turn away and forget and become unstable in our ways, but we realize the things that we now need to acknowledge and get cleansed from. It's at this early stage of the journey that we see that a lot of insecurities begin to set in by some people and compromise becomes something that they want to resort to as they tend to follow the crowd and rather be with them rather than living a set-apart life in the clear commands and instructions of our master. So Etham can picture for us wonderful lessons in understanding this picture of who's, who's, who are you with? Or is Yahweh with you or is the enemy with you? And in understanding this meaning of Etham, meaning with their plowshare, we also understand that during the kingdom of uh, 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 Messiah, when he comes to dwell with us, we will in many ways beat our swords into plowshare so to speak. And we see what we are told in the prophet um, through Micha in chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. It says, In the latter days it shall be that the mountain of the house of Yahweh is established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of Elohim of Yaakov, and let him teach us his ways and let us walk in his paths. For out of Zion comes forth the Torah, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem, And he shall judge men among many peoples and reprove nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither teach battle any more. 
But each one shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, with no one to make them afraid, for the mouth of Yahweh of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk, each one in the name of his mighty one, but we walk in the name of Yahweh our Elohim forever and ever. So with their plowshare can speak of unity, that Israel has in terms of understanding this that's renewed at the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Ingathering, the reunion, so to speak. And when we look at Sukkot, after Sukkot, what happens on a practical level? They take out their plowshares and they start digging the earth so that they start preparing for the next season. And so what we can learn from the stop is a clear distinction of who is with us. Is it Emmanuel? Remember we sang there, Emmanuel, El is with us, or is it the imposter? Because Emmanuel is not Jesus Christ. You know, and there are some people who think they've come out and they think they're starting to keep Sabbath, but they're still in a system that's worshipping the imposter. You know, and so may we truly learn to walk in and stay in the master. As we work the field of the harvest, he says, pray to the Father for workers in the harvest because the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. So what this stop teaches us is to realize who's with us. And when we realize that Yahweh is with us, it gives us strength to sojourn on. And the promise of him making it clear to Israel that he was with them, he gave them a column of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. This was such an encouragement that we see in these last two verses of this chapter giving us clear insight of things that we are to carefully consider in our own lives. Because it's from this picture that we get the confidence of seeing how Yahweh assures us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. If we stay in him, he makes our stay with us. And that making his stay with us, his stay with us, makes it abundantly clear that he will guard us as his own. You know, the visible proof of his presence would certainly have encouraged Israel coming out in an orderly manner and they wouldn't slow down. They had light for the night and for the day so that they could sojourn under the powerful sustenance of our master who was giving them a clear recovery of breath to get out from the enslavement under Pharaoh's hand. And so we're told, told to also come out of darkness, and we're, we're told to offer up the praises to our master who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And with our master, we recognize the Psalms that teach us with him, darkness is as light. So therefore, we need not fear the valley of the shadow of death. We need not fear the darkness because with Yahweh, when he's with us, he is the light. Then we are in the light as children of light and we walk as children of light. And we don't walk as children of darkness. We see this theme repeated all through Shaul's letters. Did you want to share something? Now, since we're even talking about the coming out in fight, it's, yes, there's going to be fighting when you enter the promised land. But for me, it's like Yahweh needs to train you to trust him first before yes. he trains you to fight. Yes. So, but even in the fighting, it's fighting with his armor. And his sword, which is the word, I mean, I know they had physical battle because that's what they had to do to take the physical land. Yes. But he first had to train them to trust him before, because, I mean, it's a straight line. to. Yeah. Him, yeah. But now they had to go all the way around and come in from the other side. Yeah. But that was training them to trust him before they could conquer the land. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you don't go through the necessary training to skillfully handle that which has been entrusted to, for you as a, an inheritance, if you're not skillfully trained to handle that, you'll lose it, you'll squander it very quickly. They came to the first place where the battle was when Mitzrayim charged off after. He said, stand still and see me. Yes. Fight. We're going to read that yeah, just now. Yeah. Fight for your own life. Just no. stand still and watch me. Yeah. I'm bringing you out. <laughs> yeah. And so we see a wonderful picture here with the cloud and the pillar of fire, a pillar, uh, you know, the column of cloud, pillar of fire. The Hebrew word for cloud is anan, which means a cloud, a cloud mass, a heavy mist, and also carries the idea of covering, which makes sense because when you're under the covering of a cloud, 
And we know in Scripture that Israel moved when the cloud moved. When the cloud stood still, they kept, remained camping, whether it's for a year or a day. But when the cloud moved, they picked up their stakes and they moved. What's worth taking note of is that there were times, you know, when we look at the times where Israel grumbled, and it may have possibly arisen due to the fact that they had to pick up camp. I mean, it wasn't an easy task to, you know, uh, uh, pick up the tent pegs and get them all out, put everything in an orderly manner together. It took a lot of work. It took a lot of uh, um, order. <laughs> and, and, you know, when people are gathered in masses, most of the time order is not on the cards, in the flesh. You know, and so they might have started grumbling because of the work that it took. Oh, we just settled here, you know. Imagine if it was just for one day. We just got here. Or if it's for about a year, oh, come on, do we have to? We're so settled. You can see the mindset of the flesh. It's never content, whether it's a day or a year. And so in Hebrew, the word that sounds very similar to the Hebrew word for cloud, anan, is the word for complaining or murmuring, which is anan, phonetically sounding exactly the same. But for cloud, it's a ayin, a nun, and a nun. And for murmuring or complaining, it's a alif, a nun, and a nun. So it's a wonderful lesson, even when we consider that the picture, for, or the picture that we get in the pictographs, even for the, the ayin, which is a picture of an eye, which gives the idea of looking to, or what, and we've spoken at length about who you're looking at, what you're listening to. We are to fix our eyes on the prince and perfecter of our belief. We are to fix our eyes on the cloud rider. So anan for cloud means a clear picture of those that are actually looking to our master in Elohim. Where the picture of murmuring and, and grumbling and complaining with the aleph, which is a picture of a head of an ox, which means strength, is a picture of not looking to the master, but looking to their own strength and realizing, oh, this is hard work. But they're not realizing what they should be working or who they are working to and what is actually the purpose of their journey. And we are to work out our deliverance with fear and trembling as we keep our eyes fixed on the master. And so what does complaining reveal? It reveals simply an ingratitude for Yahweh's care and provision. In Bamidbar 11, when we get to the book of Numbers, we'll deal a lot with complaining and rebellion. We'll deal a bit with it here on this part in Shemot 2. But in Bamidbar, or Numbers 11, verse 1, it says, It came to be when the people were as complainers, it was evil in the ears of Yahweh. And Yahweh heard it, and his displeasure burned, and the fire of Yahweh burned amongst them and consumed those in the outskirts of the camp. The Israelites had everything they needed. They had the presence of Yahweh um, above everything that they needed in terms of sustenance. They had Yahweh's presence in their midst. They neglected his covering and they sought their own in terms of pleasure that they would rather have. And they began to complain about what they didn't have. They complained about what they used to have and they complained about what they had at that time. Have you ever found yourself complaining like this? Oh, what I used to have or oh, what I want to have. Or oh, Shaul says, I've learned to be content in all matters. Isn't it funny how in the flesh people are never content, they'll complain? You know? You don't have what you want, you don't have what you used to have, and you don't like what you have now. Sound familiar to some people? People are often not content. The danger and problem with complaining with your situation is that it becomes very contagious. It's like a deadly virus, you know? Your complaining will affect and, and it will even infect others into complaining. And before you know it, we'll have what we read about in Scripture, a mixed multitude lusting for selfish pleasure. Shaul reminds us in Philippians that do all matters without grumblings and disputings in order that you be blameless and faultless. Because we read that when Yahweh heard their grumbling, it was evil in his eyes. It wasn't a functional thing. It's not an orderly, functional thing to be complainers. Being under the cloud is the emphasis of B'mit Banai. When we look here, the promise of the cloud in Shemot 13, but B'mit Banai actually carries the idea. And in eight verses in B'mit Banai, we see the word for cloud being used 11 times. It's a clear emphasis about, and that was when the cloud moved, the people moved, when it stayed, the people stayed, etc., etc., the emphasis was being under the guidance and the direction of Yahweh. 
And what we learn in Scripture is we have a cloud rider who is the maker of the heavens and earth. But what do people try to do when they do what's right in their own eyes? They try to become their own cloud makers, so to speak. In leaning back towards slavery, rather than relying on Yahweh, and as Kalin said, learning to trust him. What do complainers do? Complain. Because that's all they do. And in the process, they're very destructive rather than constructive. And as a result of complaining, the wrath of Yahweh, when I read from that passage, Bermit 11, verse 1, where he destroyed those on the outskirts of the camp, what you've noticed in life, I'm sure, through various situations and groups that you might have been, whether it's for work, whether it's for family, whether it's for uh, uh, worship, whatever it is, that it always tends to be those on the outskirts that are the ones that are the chirpers on the sidelines, so to speak. They're never willing to actually do something, but they're always complaining about what's being done or what's not being done, you know? And it's not being done the way they like it, so they moan. And what happens with the outskirts? They become this behind-the-scenes voice that tries to lure more people to complain to justify their reason for complaining. And we see this pattern through the wilderness journey with Kurach and Dathan and, and Viram, you know, and wonderful lessons that we are, are, are to learn here is don't complain. Listen to the master. Stay in the order of the master. Hebrews says, do not refuse the one speaking. Also says, listen to those leading you. It's not going to be good for you if you complain because you're not getting your way. That's just tantrum toddler stage. Is that is, is toddlers that tantrum? Yes. You know, there's very senior citizen toddlers today. Does it make sense? <laughs> you know? And one of the things that we, we take note of here is that when people are moaning and groaning about something, that's the problem, is that they're idle. They're not actually engaging. They're not seeking, how can I help? What can I do? And there's no commitment to fellowship and building because it's all about themselves, and all they want is knowledge. They want to be puffed up with a lot of knowledge, but they'll never actually engage in a functional relationship within a, a body. And in verse 6, it, it basically says, these complainers were saying, all that's here, this is in Bermit we see all that's here is manna. Once what, what people are saying is they're not getting what they want, I want more than what you're offering. And in Shemot 13, verse 21, Yahweh makes it clear that his presence would not cease before the people. And he would lead them. And the Hebrew word for lead, nacha, means to, be, to lead, to guide, to bring forth, to govern. So in other words, the idea of Yahweh leading you means you must let him govern your life. You must let him instruct you. And Tehillah 5 verse 8 says, O oh, Yahweh, lead me in your righteousness because of those watching me. Make your way straight before my face. Tehillah 23 verse 3, it says, He turns back my being. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We are to be people that are led in the righteousness of Yahweh, which is according to his commands. And we are to do it in the order that he's given forth in his body so that we are not out of line. And Israel were therefore given light in the darkness, so to speak, a powerful witness of understanding the prophetic shadow picture of our master, the light of the world, coming on the fourth day and bringing us out of darkness so that we can be children of light. And Shaul says in his letter to the Thessalonians that we are not in darkness, that the day should overtake us as a thief. We know about the appointments. When we start keeping his Sabbaths, we should know his appointments. Therefore, we're not kept in the dark, so to speak. And so we're on this journey recognizing Yahweh is with us, and as long as we keep our eyes on the cloud rider and the light of life, then we can keep our garments clean we can keep our lamps filled with oil of the pledge of his spirit upon us as we meditate on his torah day and night and we can be led in his righteousness in the orderly functional manner making sure that there's no complaining or groaning groan you know groaning in our lives amen let's continue in chapter 14 for in our journey is is uh henry carrying on there with 14 Ricardo.
And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn and camp before pi Achirot, between Migdol and the sea, opposite baal Zipon. Camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh shall say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land, the wilderness has closed them in. And I shall strengthen the heart of Pharaoh, and he shall pursue them. But I am to be esteemed for Pharaoh, and over all his army. And the Mitzrites shall know that I am Yahweh, and they did so. And it was reported to the sovereign of Mitzrayim that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made his chariot ready, and took his people with him. And he took six hundred choice chariots, and all, of, all the chariots of Mitzrayim with officers over all of them. And Yahweh strengthened the heart of Pharaoh, the sovereign of Mitzrayim, and he pursued the children of Israel. But the children of Israel went out defiantly. And the Mitzrites pursued him, and all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, and his horsemen, and his army, and overtook them, camping by the sea besides Piachirot before Baal Sifon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes and saw the Mitzrites coming up after them. And they were greatly afraid, so the children of Israel cried out to Yahweh. And they said to Moshe, Did you take us away to die in the wilderness, because there was no burial site in Mitzrayim? What is this you have done to us, to bring us up out of Mitzrayim? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Mitzrayim, saying, Leave us alone and let us serve the Mitzrites? For it would have been better for us to serve the Mitzrites than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the deliverance of Yahweh, which he does for you today. For the Mitzrites whom you see today, you are never, never to see again. Yahweh does fight for you, and you keep silent. And Yahweh said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Speak to the children of Israel and let them go forward. And you, lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And let the children of Israel go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, see, I am strengthening the hearts of the Mitzrites, and they shall follow them. And I am to be esteemed for Pharaoh, and over all his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Mitzrites shall know that I am Yahweh, when I am esteemed for Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the messenger of Elim, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them, and a column of cloud went from before them and stood behind them, and came between the camp of the Mitzrites and the camp of Israel. And it was the cloud and the darkness, and he gave light by night, and the one did not come near the other all the night. And Moshe stretched out his hand over the sea. And Yahweh caused the sea to go, to go back by a strong east wind all that night. And Yahweh and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on the right and on the left. And the Mitzrayim pursued them, went after them, into the midst of the sea, all the horses of Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to be in the morning watch, that Yahweh looked down upon the army of the Mitzrayim through the column of fire and cloud, and he brought the army of the Mitzrayim into confusion. And he took off the chariot wheels, so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Mitzrayim said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for Yahweh fights for them against the Mitzrites. Then Yahweh said to Moshe, Stretch out your hand over the sea, and let the waters come back upon the Mitzrites, on the chariots, and on their horsemen. And Moshe stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its usual flow at the break of day, with the Mitzrites fleeing into it. Thus Yahweh overthrew the Mitzrites into, in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them and not even one was left of them. And the children of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on the right and on the left. Thus Yahweh saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Mitzrites, and Israel saw the Mitzrites dead on the seashore. And Israel saw the great work which Yahweh had done in Mitzrayim, and the people feared Yahweh and believed Yahweh and his servant Moshe. Okay, so we see another stop along the way of their journey called Pihachiroth. And when we un look at this, we also learn, like with every stop, wonderful lessons for us today in our journey in the Master. Now, Pihachiroth means place where the sedge grows. And the word pi or pe means mouth, and hachiroth means wrath. So we can see a powerful imagery here in terms of the imagery of the wrath out of the mouth is something that we can identify with, especially as we consider, once again, the revelation of Yeshua Messiah, as in 
that which was given in Chazon chapter 12, verse 14 to 15, when we see the woman was given two wings of a great eagle to fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. And out of his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river after the woman to cause her to be swept away by the river. So what we also see here is that the serpent certainly is um, unleashing his wrath upon people. He's doing his utmost to just do what he can to destroy and swallow up the, the people and the women against in the wilderness. And so we have here the parallel picture of Pharaoh unleashing a wrath against Israel that he had driven out, but now he's pursuing. And when they were camped here at Pihachiroth, Israel was helped here by the crossing through the Sea of Reeds on dry land, and Pharaoh and his army were killed. What an awesome event that took place here where the enemy was trying to pour out wrath against Yahweh's beloved covenant people and Yahweh's wrath destroyed his enemy. And this is the parallel picture that we get given to us in Chazon. Chazon 12 verse 16, carrying on, it says, The earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And in Chazon 13 verse 1, we see a beast coming out of the sea from the dead. And it was here at Pihachiroth, having crossed through the Sea of Reeds, that Moshe proclaimed praise for Yahweh after Pharaoh and his whole army had died and was swallowed up by the sea, which we'll look at in, in part of the song of Moshe that we see in the next chapter. And all through this, we see these parallel pictures that we've seen through the plagues and through this coming out of Mitzrayim, passing through the sea in Chazon 13 verse 4. We see what the people were doing when Moshe celebrated the deliverance that Yahweh had brought for them coming through the sea. We see in Chazon 13 verse 4 how the people are marveling by the beast that comes out of the sea. And it says in 13 verse 4 of Revelation, they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worshipped the beast saying, who is like the beast who is able to fight with him? And what we see here is that the masses, the blasphemies that are being spewed out of the mouths of the masses in the worship of the beast. Now we see again a clear picture of choice. Who's with you? Yahweh or the imposter? The imposter takes on many forms. We understand that we who have the breath of Yahweh, a recovery of breath, are to praise him and him alone. Tehillah says, all that has breath, praise Yahweh. You know? Now, Pihachiroth was east of Baal Tefon, which means Lord of the North or Lord of the Hidden or secret place. Baal means Lord, husband or landowner, and it was the actual name of a supreme uh, a male divinity of the Phoenicians or Canaanites. And the Hebrew word Tefon means north, coming from the verb Tzafan, which is to hide or treasure up. And in Scripture, the idea of north represents a, a number of pictures for us. It firstly represents the picture of judgment, especially when we look at the encampment order of the children of Israel in the tabernacle, where the north camp was the camp of Dun. Dun means judge. We understand that Yahweh disciplined and brought judgment upon the house of Israel and on the house of Yehuda from the north by bringing the Assyrians in first to take Israel out and bringing the Babylonians in coming from the north, a picture of judgment. But we're also told in the book of Tephania, which means hidden by Yah, that in the day of Yahweh, who will be hidden in him? In other words, who is found to be in the master and protected from the outpouring wrath that he is sending upon the sons of disobedience? Because Yahweh is our hiding place. The name of Yahweh is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. So we see valuable lessons here with Pihachiroth being east of Baal Tefon. We learn some valuable lessons here, you know. And what we also take note of here is that it was near Migdol, Migdol meaning tower, and the name of Yahweh is that strong tower. So there's so many parallels that we can understand through the word that Scripture gives us in taking refuge in the Master. Another lesson that we can learn from Pihachiroth, which is speaking about what comes out of the mouth, is to make sure that we guard our mouths from speaking junk. Yaakov reminds us, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brothers, this should not be so. 
You know, you bless Elohim with your mouth and then you curse man. It shouldn't be like this. We are to make sure that our, our speech is seasoned with salt. We are to be covenant speakers, building one another up, reproving where necessary, but not spewing out filth and, and unfilthy things. Or filthy things, unfilthy, unclean things. Please spew out unfilthy things, which is clean things. You know, our mouths are to declare the praise of Yahweh our Elohim, and along with that praise comes the required obedience that should be attached with it, so that we are worshippers in spirit and truth. Amen. Yahweh tells Israel to turn back, so there's a change of direction taking place here. You know, and they were going. Through, and now they even go through more rougher terrain. And as it ties in with what Kaleen was saying earlier about learning to trust Yahweh and his guidance. So he gets them to turn, and it might have seemed like this isn't the right way to go. And up until this point, it was pretty safe. They were going through a trader's route, so to speak, now taking a turn to go and pass through this narrow way through the high mountains, through a wadi, and they would come to Pihachiroth. And this is where now it feels like they were trapped because Pharaoh thought, hey, now I can get these guys. And Israel's thinking, why did you bring us out of here? Out of Mitzrayim, to kill us in the wilderness? And so we see this uncharted territory brought about a bit of panic as opposed to to trusting Yahweh. You know, when we come out of false systems, it's uncharted territory learning about the Sabbath and the, what we do on the Sabbath, going through the word that we've never been through like this before, you know, having ears to hear, accustomed to actually sitting and engaging and thinking about what we're doing as opposed to the corrupt system that we did and tick boxes, did our own things. It's uncharted territory. And that, for many people, becomes uncomfortable. And it's not like, uh, and they, they begin to grumble and moan. And it's not, why, why are we doing this? Why are you making me do this? You know? And Yahweh strengthened Pharaoh's heart once again, and he went after Israel, and he pursued Israel. And this Hebrew word for pursue carries the clear idea of chasing after. I mean, he wasn't just going, oh, let's go see what they're doing. He was on the hunt to get his people back. Now, this same root word that's used for pursue, which is the radaf, is given to us as an instruction in Yeshayahu 51, verse 1. It says, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, seeking Yahweh. Look to the rock you were hewn from and to the hole of the pit you were dug from. In other words, here's a clear call. We are to be pursuing, renewed writing, Shoal says, pursue a partner, for without which you will not see the master. If you are not following closely after, hunting in many ways, running after our master and his righteousness, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. If we're not pursuing our master, when you pursue something, it takes all effort. It's not a leisurely stroll where you get to take in the sights. It's a pursuit where your eyes are fixed with a purpose. And this is what Pharaoh, he had a purpose, wanted to get the people back. And now here we see it felt very dangerous for them, you know. And we are told that Israel went out with a high hand, Bayat Ramah. They went out victorious plundering Mitzrayim, and some translations say they went out defiantly, or it says here, and it's like they, they went out in order but with victory. And so Israel started out great, coming out with order, great defiance of the wrong ways in order to walk in the ordered ways of Yahweh, that's coming out with a high hand of victory, walking in the victorious procession, but very quickly they their defiance to wrong ways and to submitting to Yahweh's it became a defiance of Yahweh's order, you know. And here's the, probably the most striking passage in this chapter, which gives a sure promise. Don't be afraid. Stand still. These were intense militaristic style orders given by Moshe. A call for strength in their belief in the Elohim who fights for them. They had their orders, and that was to stand firm. And we have our orders today. When Shaul says, put on the armor of Elohim and stand, it's not a suggestion. It's an order. 
Tehillah 27 verse 1 to 3, David gives wonderful praise. He says, Yahweh is my light and my deliverance. Whom should I fear? Yahweh is the refuge of my life. Whom should I dread? When evil comes up against me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamps against me, then my heart does not fear. Though battle comes up against me, even then I would be trusting. It's coming back to this. What do you do when you're facing the battles of life? You crumble. No, I'm not saying you do, but most people crumble. Or do you stand firm and say, Yahweh is my light and my deliverance. Whom should I dread? You know, Yahweh, David made this personal and so too must we. Yahweh is not only the light, he's my light, he's our light, you know. And in Yeshiyahu 60 verse 1, where we're told that our light has come, you know, arise, shine, for your light has come. That's written as Ba'urecha. And again, it's our light as a collective that we have Yahweh collectively as our light. Yochanan 12 verse 46, our master says, I have come as a light into the world so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. And he was basically saying we are to put our trust in him and not in the arm of the flesh, not in horses and chariots. Don't go back to Mitzrayim. Trust in our Savior because he is the one who fights for us. And what it takes of us is our ability to obey the command, to station ourselves and stand and see him fight for us. What a powerful picture that's given here. You know, David was basically saying here that Yahweh is my strength. He's my savior. He saves me, you know. He's the refuge of my life. The declaration that he was making, he was asking two questions. One is, whom should I fear? The other is, whom should I dread? And so fear it carries the idea to be afraid or to have reverence, to be in awe. Dread means to tread or shake or, or, or to be in terror. can also mean to have an attitude or emotion of severe, severe distress over an impending danger or trouble with a focus that it can be so intense that it can cause physical trembling and shaking. It can also mean to be in a state of a profound awe and respect so intense that the body may act with trembling and shaking. Now, I'm not talking with the hocus-pocus junk that the corrupt religious systems put on. What we're talking about here, David was basically declaring, Yahweh is my light, he saves me. Now, whom should I fear? Whom should I stand in awe and show respect and have reverence for? The obvious answer is Yahweh. Our light and our deliverance. The second question basically saying, because Yahweh is my strong tower, the refuge for my being, whom should I be afraid of or who should cause me to be in distress or terror? And the answer is no one. So we see a twofold thing here. So what are you afraid of? Our master said, David said, I'm not afraid of anyone because my master is my refuge. He's my strength. Stand still and see the deliverance of Yahweh. Stand still and see Yahushua deliver his people today. That's in essence what was be, being told here, Yahweh our Savior. Yirmiyahu 42 verse 11 says, Do not be afraid of the sovereign of Babel, of whom you are afraid. Do not be afraid of him, declares Yahweh, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. The key element that we have to do in not being afraid and watching Yahweh do his work of deliverance in our lives is to stand still and to station ourselves. And the Greek word that's used here in the Septuagint is the same word that's used in Ephesians 6 when we are told to stand, histemi. Make a stand, take a firm stand, be established, ready and prepared, a steadfast mind, upholding the authority of something. We uphold the authority of the Torah of our Master. And that's when we can begin to see the deliverance of our Master, that we get to work out in obedience with fear and dread before his face, with fear and trembling. So who do we fear and tremble before? Yahweh, not before man or any institution or any corrupt system of this world. In Shemot, when we see this instruction, stand still and see the deliverance of Yahweh, this is very much alive and extremely important for us all to continually hear today and standing firm. The phrase, the deliverance of Yahweh, 
is written as Et Yahush- Yeshuat Yahweh, Et Yeshuat Yahweh. And it, we see a powerful witness here, the salvation, the deliverance of Yahweh. They had to stand still and watch. They were, in, in essence, between a rock and a sea. It was to say a hard place, okay? But the phrase of a rock and a hard place, no way out, that's where they were. And here, stand still and watch Yahweh. I mean, they'd seen him destroy everything that was worshipped in Mitzrayim. Now it was time to see really how he's delivering them from all this, you know? What a powerful thing this is and one that we must, you know, this standstill can also be a good lesson for us of just being quiet, having those times where we just recognize that it's Yahweh who's fighting for me. But you can't if you are not in obedience to Yahweh. If you're not armed in his armor, guarding his word, you can't stand still and claim that Yahweh is fighting for you which a lot of people tend to do. They're disobedient. They're not listening to instruction. They're not listening to those leading them. They're doing their own thing, doing their own ways, not listening to wise counsel, but yet then claim, yeah, but you know what? Yahweh's going to make it work. Yahweh's going to fight. He's fighting for me. He'll sort it out. But when they're not, they're cutting corners. They're taking the short route. They actually haven't learned to trust Yahweh. So they cut corners. And here's the lesson for us. When we trust Yahweh, it implies an obedience to his word. That's when we begin to see the deliverance that Yahweh gives us in our life to work out and walk out with joy, fear and trembling before his face, done with praise of who he is, with hands held high in praise of our master, you know. And Moshe made it clear. They were grumbling, they were complaining, and he basically said, keep quiet. Shush. He said it very politely, I'm sure. Keep quiet and see the deliverance. The Hebrew word for keep silent, charash, means be silent, be dumb, speechless, say nothing. And often translations have had this as hold your peace, which I think is quite fitting. As we recognize that that which our master has worked for us through his life, death, and resurrection, that we must guard and hold on to his peace without grumbling. We must guard the shalom in our our lives, you know. Mishle 11 verse 12 says, He who lacks heart despises his neighbor, but a man of understanding keeps silence. When we have understanding because we're guarding the word, we know we have a journey to walk as we sojourn in the master. We know we have enemies that are trying to destroy us. But as we're armed in the Torah, we can see Yahweh becomes our refuge. He is our shield. He is our reward. He's our rear guard. And when we see the picture of the cloud going to behind them and making this separation between Pharaoh and Israel, it's a clear witness that Yahweh has our back. We'll learn more about that when we go through the encampment order and design of the tabernacle and the journeyings of Israel that were given. And here this command to go forward is stop standing, I mean, stand still, see Yahweh's deliverance, but in that, go forward. Stop shrinking back, you know. Have a moving, active belief as you trust in the Master. Shaul says, I have strength to do all through Messiah who empowers me. And here we see Yahweh says to Moshe, you know, take your rod and stretch it out over the waters. And he brings the east wind all that night. So they also had to endure the night. <laughs> Think about it. Hearing the, hearing the chariots and the army coming. And here's a sea. And the east wind comes and it parts the sea. And the Yahweh then makes Israel go on dry land. And it's a powerful witness here because the sea was a wall to them on their left and to the right. This is not some cyclical experience or event that would take place that Yahweh positioned them there at this specific moment. So that time, no, this was a miracle. This was Yahweh's hand, you know. And with this parting of the sea, with a wall on the right and the left, it's not some like some try and explain away. Even on the Torah walk, they're trying to explain some geological actions that took place. This is Yahweh's hand defying the nature of nature, so to speak. Well, not defying it. How can I say? He's commanding nature at his beck and call to do what he says, just as when he calmed the seas, because he's in control. And he parted the waters. Israel go through on dry land. The Mitzrites thought they could do the same thing. And Yahweh brought confusion amongst the Mitzrites. 
and broke their chariot wheels. They were all in disarray, and he killed a lot of them. Israel are standing on the bank of the other side of the sea, and they start seeing all these bodies floating up. What a sight that must have been. I mean, I'm, I'm, in, a certain, in, ten, in, in the te, in sense of how Yahweh proved himself to be their deliverer. And anybody who had any doubts, surely they can completely trust Yahweh now. You know, the people feared and believed Yahweh and his servant Moshe. They had now seen the deliverance of Yahweh standing on the other side of the sea, all the Mitzrians dead, drowned. Can you imagine that sight? This would certainly put one to be in the proper fear of Yahweh because you don't want to face the same what the Mitzrites, Mitzrites had, had faced. And this didn't last too long because the next challenge of their belief came because Yahweh is continually testing us. The wilderness journey is there to test us to see whether his word is in our hearts and our mouths to do it. They forgot very quickly of the mighty power of the arm of Yahweh until he once again proved himself. And we must be on guard against this. It's almost like the journey that they had is this roller coaster faith. I can call it that. And many people tend to go on that. And we should be on guard against that roller coaster kind of faith. You know, we're going to encounter various trials. Our master made it clear in this world, you will have trouble. But take courage. He's overcome the world. You know, and so they believed Moshe too. And it's an important lesson for us because there are too many people today who don't believe Moshe because they don't believe the Torah is necessary. And so we understand when we want to see the deliverance of our master, you can't understand Yeshua Messiah and his deliverance that he brought if you're not going to believe what's written in the Torah because it's the guarding of the commands that helps you understand collectively the possession possessing of the witness of Yeshua Messiah that goes hand in hand. You cannot possess a, a complete, clear witness of Yeshua Messiah without believing the Torah. And believing implies a doing, because belief without works is dead. So we have to understand our necess uh, how necessary the Torah is for us in understanding the witness of our Deliverer, who Yahweh, our Savior, is. And when we see him working a work in our own lives that's called us out of darkness, out of the corruption of that which was killing us, and now the promise of life, we must guard ourselves from having this roller coaster thing that people have, which will cause many to die in the process, fall away, because they're not steadfast in standing firm in the Master and watching him do his work. You don't read the history. You can't have the right faith. No. Because this is how one proves himself. I mean, in, in the sense of we are the product of thousands of years now. Yes. These guys had no Satan from slavery. Then they entered into this worship in the promised land. Yeah. And that is the example that we have to follow. Yeah. If you don't read this, you don't know that you can stand still in a battle and you know, can do everything. Because yeah. I was, I, I'm going through the kings, and it, it just struck me that I mean, sometimes you think, why, why did it never sink in this? But most of the kings that went into exile or the generations, they made covenants with those kings yeah. to help them fight battles in their own land when they should have trusted Yahweh. And then those kings ended up taking them into exile. I mean, Yahweh used them, but yeah. I'm saying. Your heart was in the first place. That king can help me fight. Yeah. Where you, you shouldn't ever let no. him let him help you. Yeah. Should always have been Yahweh. Yeah. And I think that's the problem with people in the world as well. They make covenants with nations and other people, the arm of flesh, chariots and horses, because they think that that can save them. Yeah. And that will be the thing that will eventually overcome you, because it's not Yahweh. So it was just. Isn't this the point? Yeah. If we don't read this, we will never know what Yahweh can do for us. Yes. We'll, it's almost like I'm, I don't play Yahshua's miracles down, but it's not just about the healing the sicknesses and the diseases. No. It's about these types of miracles that He can do in your life. Yes. Because this is who He is. Yeah. 
But if you don't read it, you'll never know. If, you don't, if, if, if one doesn't read these accounts, and we get to read it every year collectively for good reason, because we must be reminded. And the clear witness is on a body basis for all of us together, as well as individually, we can learn lessons from this. That when it feels like we have no escape route, <laughs> that is when we are to stand still. And standing still doesn't mean waiting for things just to happen. I mean, we, must, we must get the idea here. This, this lessons that we turn, learn from this in terms of parable lessons teach us vital truths in our master. Standing still in him doesn't mean doing nothing. It means in him taking your firm stand of doing what's required because that's a standing firm in the belief. You're not rocked from your position of belief in him. That's the standing still. But that standing still in belief causes one to obey in your daily workings. Not joining yourself to the arms of the flesh because you're in a bind and you're in a tough spot, no way out, so you seek whatever way is going to rescue you Yahweh is the only one who can rescue you as you obey him. But what people tend to do, they want Yahweh to rescue, but they are resorting to arm of the flesh works, putting trust in joining hands with unbelievers, putting trust in them and thinking, okay, if I do this with them, that's how Yahweh is going to work it out. No, that's you trying to direct. Instead of you just obeying with what you are called to do, and seeing Yahweh bring about what you would never have thought or imagined. Yes. Because we came to want to do everything else for me. Yes. Yes, I handed it over to Yahweh, but I can stop trying. Mm. If you can say stop, my time is for it. That's it. That's yeah. And we've got to learn it. But that, that's exactly it. But the standing still, I want to emphasize, the standing still doesn't mean give up everything you've tried and just, okay, well, now just wait around, you know. Standing still is a remaining in obedience, which we're con so we're consistently told to stand. That's the armor of Elohim. But the righteousness is a doing thing. So it's, it kind of sounds weird to an untrained ear. Am I supposed to stand? Am I supposed to sit? Am I supposed to run? Am I supposed to walk? What am I? You're, you're confused. No, we're not confused. You're supposed to do all of the above. Does it make sense? And, and the, I, I fear that many people who have come out are not in belief standing in the truth because they still got elements of the flesh that's causing them to take off bits of the armor in many ways and their feet are slipping. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to give analogies here because now they find themselves building on sand. And when the storms of life come, they're not actually able to stand their ground and confess who it is that they're trusting in and let that confession be met up with obedient works of righteousness. You know? If you're standing on the rock, the person whose hand you're holding is measuring up. He's going to pull you off the rock. The, Chance, the, the danger result is probably better than he's going to pull you off rather than you pulling him up. Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to a song of victory as we look at chapter 15. Then Yahweh and the children of Israel sang, then Moshe and the children of Israel sang the song to Yahweh and spoke, saying, I sing to Yahweh, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Yah is my strength and song, and he has become my deliverance. He is my El, and I praise him, Elohim of my father, and I exalt him. Yahweh is a man of battle, Yahweh is his name. He has cast Pharaoh's chariots and his army into the sea, and his chosen officers are drowned in the sea of reeds. The depths covered them, they went down to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Yahweh, has become great in power. Your right hand, O Yahweh, has crushed the enemy. And in the greatness of your excellence, you pulled down those who rose up against you. <clears throat> you sent forth your wrath, it consumed them like stubble. And with the wind of your nostrils, the waters were heaped up. The floods stood like a wall. 
the depths became stuck in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I pursue, I overtake, I divide the spoil, my being is satisfied on them. On them I draw out my sword, my hand destroys them. You do blow with your wind, the sea covered them, they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Yahweh, among the mighty ones? Who is like you, great in set apartness, awesome in praises, working wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. In your loving commitment, you led the people from whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you guided them with your set up. To In your loving commitment, you led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you guided them to your set apart dwelling. Peoples heard, they trembled, anguish gripped the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom were troubled. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, grips them. All the inhabitants of Kenna unmelted. Fear and dread fell on them. By the greatness of your arm, they are as silent as a stone, until your people pass over, O Yahweh, until the people whom you have fought pass over. You bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Yahweh, which you have made for your own dwelling. The set-apart place, O Yahweh, which your hand have prepared. Yahweh reigns forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went with his chariots and his horsemen into the sea, and Yahweh brought back the waters of the sea upon them. And the children of Israel went on dry ground in the midst of the sea. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aharon, took the timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing to Yahweh, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. And Moshe brought Israel from the sea of reeds, and went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness, and found no water. And they came to Mara, and they were unable to drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter, so the name of it was called Mara. And people grumbled against, Mo against Moshe, saying, What are we to drink? Then he cried out to Yahweh, and Yahweh showed him a tree. And when he threw it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a law and a right ruling for them, and there he tried them. And he said, If you diligently obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim, and do what is right in his eyes, and shall listen to his commands, and shall guard all his laws, I shall bring on you none of the diseases I brought on the Mitzrites, for I am Yahweh who heals you. And they came to Elam, where there were twelve fountains of water and seventy palm trees, and they camped there by the waters. Praise Yahweh for this song of Moshe that we can learn wonderful lessons from. You know, um, there's so much that we can learn from a lot of the worship that's contained in Scripture. We've looked a, a number of times at the abundance of worship that's contained in the book of Chazon or Revelation. And here is the first recorded account in Scripture of an assembly or body of believers singing a song of praise to Yahweh. And this is their first account of a song being used to praise Him. This doesn't mean that people weren't doing it before. I believe that there were certainly songs of praise sung to Him before this. But what we see here is Moshe and the children of Israel singing together. This was a day of deliverance, a sure reason to be singing praises to Elohim a wonderful prophetic shadow picture of what once again will be sung by a delivered and redeemed people, which we also see in, in, in Yeshiyahu 12, where it says, In that day you shall say, I thank you, Yahweh. Though you were enraged with me, your displeasure has turned back, and you, get, you have comforted me. See, El is my deliverance. I trust and am not afraid. For Yah, Yahweh is my strength and my song, and he has become my deliverance. And you shall draw water with joy from the fountains of deliverance. And in that day you shall say, Praise Yahweh, call upon his name, and make known his deeds among the peoples. Make mention that his name is exalted. Sing to Yahweh, for he has done excellency, excellently. This is known in all the earth. Cry aloud and shout, O inhabitant of Zion, for great is the set-apart one of Israel in your midst. Fitting song of praise that can fit in with the situation 
that carries with it great prophetic nature of in that day as a reference, a clear picture of when our master comes in his second coming where our deliverance will be made complete. And those who fear Yahweh and walk in obedience to his Torah will be able to sing the song of deliverance, the song of Moshe. We, in essence, have been shown the end from the beginning. In Chazon 15, verse 1 to 4, it says, I saw another sign in the heaven, great and marvelous, seven messengers having the seven last plagues, for the wrath of Elohim was ended in them. And I saw like a sea of glass mixed with fire and those overcoming the beast and his image and his mark and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding hearts of Elohim. And they sing the song of Moshe, the servant of Elohim, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Yahweh El Shaddai. Righteous and true are your ways, O sovereign of the set-apart ones. Who shall not fear you, O Yahweh, and esteem your name? Because you alone are kind, because all nations shall come and worship before you, for your righteousnesses have been made manifest. I love this because here we see a powerful part in the song of Moshe here is Yahweh is a man of battle. Yahweh is his name. In Yeshayahu 12, it's a clear call to praise his name, make known his name. His name is exalted. And in Chazon 15, Yahweh El Shaddai, O Yahweh, esteem your name. It's all about his name. We've spoken about this at large many times, you know, and here we understand this name of Yahweh declaring who it is that causes us to be and becomes the cause of our deliverance. According to this, it's a clear witness that it will be those who overcome the beast and his mark and the image and the mark and number of his name that will be able to sing the song after the last plague, sung by a people who have turned to the master, put their trust in him, walked in his ways, guarding the commands given through Moshe at Mount Sinai. So this is a powerful picture. You know, when we are to sing to our master, that's why we begin our gatherings together with worship, praise and worship of our master, because it's, it's, it's that vocal expression that begins our entrance into his pr presence, giving him thanks for why we're here, you know. And it's an attribute, using our voice to sing to Yahweh is an attribute of giving thanks, or rather that which actually should flow from within us in giving thanks, you know. Now the Hebrew word for sing, shir, comes from the word shur, which means to travel or journey. And it's a powerful thing because one lexicon actually describes this root word shur as being a strolling singer. And figuratively shows us how David is a good example for us would sing wherever he went, whether he was in a cave hiding from Shaul or his enemies or his sons or, you know, whether he was on the throne praising Yahweh, seated on the throne that was set up for his reign. Praise could not be with, withheld from his lips, no matter his circumstances. Yes, he poured out his complaints. He praised Yahweh. And how about you? Are you praising Yahweh in all circumstances? You know? Can you declare Yahweh is your strength in your song? That's what David uh, uh, proclaimed in Tehillah 27, which you read earlier. Here, Moshe is beginning this clear witness of the horse and the rider is destroyed. Miriam picked up the timbrels afterwards and began. The horse and the rider has gone into this, has gone into the sea, you know, has been thrown into the sea. They've drowned, they're dead. Your enemy is no more. And we who are in the master... We can see the victory song that we can give because he's overcome death. And this is giving us the ability to, in knowing that, declaring who your strength and your song is. You know, this is a collective thing that we see. Yahweh should be your strength and song. It goes hand in hand. Tila 28 says, Yahweh is my strength and my shield. My heart is trusted in, it, in him and I have been helped. Therefore, my heart exalts and with my song, I thank him. You see this pattern that we see in scripture? Yahweh is the strength of his people. He is the stronghold of deliverance of his anointed. Yahweh was bold. He wasn't arrogant in declaring these words. He could declare these words because he knew who his rock and deliverer was. He knew who it is that he would be singing praise to. You know, is Yahweh your strength and your shield? 
Blessed are those whose strength is in Yahweh, not in the arm of the flesh. And when your strength is in Yahweh, as Shaul says, he can do all through Messiah who empowers him, who gives him strength to do all. Now, Shaul could certainly say that, being one who was whipped, left for dead, stranded at sea, shipwrecked, beaten, in hunger, had a lot going for him at times too. No matter the circumstances, he knew who his strength was. Until 118 verse 14 says, Yahweh, Yah is my strength and song. He has become my deliverance. Again, he's the cause of everlasting deliverance to those who obey him. So we see a powerful witness here. This understanding of Yahweh being your strength and your song highlights the importance of song in our lives. And most people like to not even bother themselves with reading the Psalms. When it carries so much insight for us, it becomes personal words in our own lives as we can appropriate that individually and collectively. That's why Shoals, we, we see in the, right, in the renewed writings that we are to speak to each other in songs and psalms and hymns of praise. We should be, we should be inciting one another to declare the praise that's due to our deliverer. You know? The declaration of Yahweh being our strength and song pictures for us this joyous celebration of the deliverance that he has brought for us. And when we understand what he's done for us, then our natural ability should be overflowing with praise. It should just come forth, you know. I praise Yahweh. Yahweh is his name. Yahweh is a man of battle. Tila 24 verse 8, and David again says, Who is this sovereign of esteem? Yahweh, strong and mighty. Yahweh, mighty in battle. Once again, who is it that you are singing to? The one who fights for you. The one who fights for you is the one that you've put your trust in, that you are standing armed in completely, not moved in position of obedience. You know? The right hand of Yahweh is the working power of deliverance. Tehillah 118 verse 15 to 16 says, The voice of rejoicing and deliverance is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of Yahweh is doing mightily. The right hand of Yahweh is exalted. The right hand of Yahweh acts mightily. This is a praise for our master, Yeshua Messiah. The working power, the outstretched arm, the right hand. The one who's seated at the right hand of Elohim is not that there's a, a, a separate person seated at the right hand of Elohim. The idea of being seated is the idea of accomplished. It's now you can sit because deliverance has been accomplished. At the right hand is the working power of Elohim. Can you have the voice of rejoicing and deliverance in your heart as his mighty right hand has done mightily delivering you from sin and death? You should let praise abound in, one, in your life. And, you know, Tehillah 110 verse 1, we see a parable being given here. Yahweh said to my master, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This is a clear reference to Yeshua Messiah being the master of David, which our master asked the religious Pharisees, how is it that David calls him my master when, you know, he comes after him? And he, he puts this parable because this psalm is a parable. Because when it also says Yahweh at your right hand, it's a clear witness that there's not different people being described here. This is a deliverance song of Yahweh's arm coming to work deliverance and be accomplished. So when Messiah said it is accomplished and he ascended, he could sit down because the working of deliverance had now been done. Because he is our saviour, he is our master in Elohim, which Thomas clearly understood when he physically saw the master. And our master said, you say that because you believe. Blessed are he who hasn't seen and believes. You know? I love this powerful picture here of how Yahweh's wrath consumes. The wrath of Elohim upon his enemies, which the book of Chazon highlights the wrath of Elohim being poured out. And it's shadow picture of that which is coming again, and Yochanan the Immerser proclaimed the coming of Messiah in Matit Yahu 3 verse 12. It says, his winnowing fork is in his hand and he shall thoroughly cleanse the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the storehouse, but the chaff he shall burn with unquenchable fire. 
We can see very clearly that there is not two separate people. There's not two deliverers. There's not two Elohims. There's one master, one deliverer, one savior, one who works deliverance, one who pours out wrath, one who winnows with his fork. When our master comes again, he's coming with a quenching fire. And his wrath will consume his enemies. And here in the song of praise, it describes the power of our mighty Elohim. In verse 8, he says, with the wind of your nostrils. Can you just picture that? With the wind of your nostrils, you cause the sea to open. You know? With the breath of your nostrils, it's just Yahweh just has to breathe out of his nose and the sea parts. That's what... <laughs> That's the celebration of the power of the deliverer that Moshe is expressing here. And this is something that we must understand because when we understand how big and mighty Yahweh is and a man of battle, believe you me, Yahweh is certainly not afraid to fight for you because nothing can come against him. And when we understand that he could just give a out of his nostril, you know, a breath out of his nostrils to part the sea and bring a deliverance, then we realize how strong the breath of Yahweh is. Did you want to share something? His quenching fire. Did I say unquenching? His unquenching fire, yes. Quenching it, yeah, it burns up. Okay, he's coming with an unquenching fire to burn up. Eov, or Job 4 verse 9 says, Through the breath of Eloah, they perish, and through the spirit of his nostrils, they are consumed. Because you get the idea, the image that's given here, you know, the breath of the nostrils is like this anger that's being burst out. You know when, you know when people are angry and their nostrils flare? You know? Well, this is Yahweh's anger upon his enemies, and this is the image that's given. And his enemies must know that they are going to be destroyed, and this is a a comfort for us, but a warning, because if you make yourself an enemy with Elohim, then his breath is going to destroy you rather than refresh you, because he brings a recovery of breath to all who call upon him. You know, the empty threats of the enemy is destroyed. And here in verse 11, the song is, who is like you? Wow, there's no one like you, O Master Yahweh. And when we think of these words, we see in Chazon 15, who shall not fear you, O Yahweh, and esteem your name? I read that. It's part of the praise. Who is like you? We've looked at this in depth a, a, a while back, looking at clear witnesses of who is like you. It's a rhetorical question, obviously, because there's no one like Yahweh, our Elohim. Tehillah 35 verse 10 says, Let all my bones say, Yahweh, who is like you, delivering the poor from one stronger than he and the poor and the needy from him who robs him. Now, this psalm is saying here, let my bones say who is like you. It's not that he didn't know who Yahweh was, but it's like saying, let my bones, let my flesh be reminded that there is no one like you, so that I'm comforted in the position that I am in. How many people are gripped with fear in their physical circumstances that they don't stop, stand still, and be reminded that there is none like him in whom they take refuge? Tehillah 71 verse 19 says, For your righteousness, O Elohim, is most high. You who have done great deeds, O Elohim, who is like you? We are blessed to have such a powerful and mighty deliverer. Amen? Devarim 33 verse 29 says, Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you? A people served, or saved, not served, saved by Yahweh, the shield of your help, and he who is the sword of your excellency. And your enemies are subdued under you, and you tread down their high places. How awesome is that? We need to be reminded who is like us. But make sure you're staying in him to be reminded of that fact. You know? Tehillah 86 verse 8 says, There is none like you among the mighty ones, O Yahweh. And like your works, there are none. You stretched out your right hand. We see a powerful witness of the promise of the working of deliverance. You know, and he promised this through Moshe with the sign of the hand that would become leprous and go back and come out restored. Here's the working power overcoming sin and lawlessness for his people to deliver them to righteousness. 
And in verse 13, we're told that Yahweh guided them to his set-apart dwelling place. I love this because part of this song, remember, Moshe never got into the promised land, but Israel did. But this song, right at the beginning, in a sense of their journey, is very prophetic in nature. But it's, an, it's a, a song of deliverance that what we are able to sing today, we're able to sing with the confidence of knowing that he's given us the end from the beginning. And therefore, we can confidently be on our journey, having the firm expectation and hope that we have in him secure. So we can sing that what we see in Chazan and the deliverance of him bringing us to his dwelling place, which we are, but bringing us to the rest to be with him forever. We can sing about that right now. Moshe was singing these songs and recording these songs before they even entered into the promised land and destroyed Edom and the, and the Canaanites, etc. He is our guide. In, in, you know, as I've mentioned earlier, the root word for guide or lead, in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 22, it says, Thus Yahweh saved Chizkiyahu and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sancheriv, the sovereign of Ashur, and from the hand of all others and guided them on every side. This was at a time when Israel were under a huge threat by the Ashurians, and Yahweh saved Chizkiyahu and the rest who were in Jerusalem. While the enemy tried to cut off their water supply, we recognize the power of the complete provision and protection of Yahweh that guided them on every side, refreshing them and strengthening them, not to bow under the threats of the enemy. And this is so important for us today. There are many threats going out there, and they are viable threats. They are not pie in the sky. They're real threats that are out there today, but they shouldn't shake us. I keep saying again, don't listen to the rubbish news of the world because you can get crippled by it. Don't believe. Don't give your ear to the evil reports. Keep your ears attentive to the good report of deliverance that our master is bringing to those who are in him. You know, verse 18 is such a powerful verse. When we see here, it says, for Yahweh reigns forever and ever. There are a number of Psalms where it says, Yahweh shall reign, Yahweh shall reign, but actually the Hebrew is Yahweh reigns. You know, most translations have Yahweh reigns. The scriptures have put Yahweh shall reign, and it declares the, the praise to Hila 97, 98, around that region. There's a number of Psalms, and it's a declaration that Yahweh reigns. He is our king. And we are living out as ambassadors of our king, obedience here on earth as it is in the heavens. Amen. So declaring that Yahweh reigns forever and ever means you are serving a living Elohim. A Elohim of the living. One who reigns forever and ever. His reign does not change. It will not be replaced. It will not be voted for. <laughs> His reign is established and he lives forever and ever. Yahweh sat enthroned at the flood, and Yahweh sits as sovereign forever. Tehillah 29 verse 10. Daniel 4 verse 3 it says, How great are his signs, and how mighty is his wonders. His reign is an everlasting reign. His rulership is from generation to generation. So we don't come to our generation now and say, um, Yahweh's changed his rules. He's changed the way he's reigning. You know, he rules as sovereign from generation to generation. Matitya 6 verse 13, our master taught us how to pray. And he says, do not lead us into trial, but deliver us from the wicked one, because yours is the reign and the power and the esteem forever. Amen. We do well to realize that, you know. And as we, they're singing the song, Pharaoh and his horses are drowned in the sea while Israel are standing on dry ground. Ivrim 11 verse 29, we are told, by belief they passed through the sea, the Red Sea, and as by dry land. And when the Mitzrites died, they were drowned. Or when the Mitzrites tried, sorry, they drowned. This is a wonderful lesson of belief. By belief we do what the word says and we are delivered. Others are trying the word, but not by belief, because they're trying to get the blessings out of it. They're the ones that are going to be found to be drowning, so to speak, when the crashing waves of destruction come. Pharaoh and his men, the horses, drowned in the sea, 
And Tehillah 66 verse 5 to 7 says, Come and see the works of Elohim, awesome acts toward the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. There we rejoiced in him, who rules by his power, his, for, by his power forever, his eyes keeping watch on the nations. Let the rebellious not exalt themselves, Selah. This is a call for us again to recognize what we have in the Master. That look to the rock that you were hewn from, to the hole that you were taken out of, what you've been redeemed from, what you've been put onto. Look to the prince and perfecter of your belief. Stand still and see his deliverance. Praise him. Miriam is called prophetess and sister of Aharon. Can you picture the scene at this point that was being sung by everybody and then she carries on? She, it's like, okay, we've sung a song, no, stop. No, let's, this is a celebration, you know. This song of this multitude of people that Yahweh delivered, a, na a nation, what sound this must have echoed, <laughs> you know, through the, through the valleys and the hills of the journey that lay ahead of them. Miriam repeats Moshe's command to sing and calling others, sing with me. So when we're giving praise to Yahweh, we should call others to say, come and sing with me. Let's celebrate Yahweh together. Amen. That's why part of the pattern of going up to the feasts is that they would together be singing the psalms of praise in their procession up to Yerushalayim. As we see here, the horse and the rider is thrown into the sea. It's a picture of the arm of the flesh. Tehillah 20 verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we remember the name of Yahweh our Elohim because it's the name of Yahweh that saves. And we understand why the enemy will do his best to try and hide and distort and corrupt the name of Yahweh. There is only one name that saves. And so when we say Yahushua, that is the one name. When we say Yahweh, that is the one name because they are one. It's Yahweh, the causer of life, becomes the causer of our deliverance when we obey him. Hosea 14 verse 3 in turning back to Yahweh, Ephraim being called back declares the following, Ashur does not save us. We do not ride on horses, nor ever again do we say to the work of our hands, our mighty ones, for the fatherless finds compassion in you. I tie this in with what Karlin was saying. She's going through the kings at the moment. And certainly Ahaz went and he, got, he went to the Ashurians and saw what they worshipped and what they did and said, hey, make a slaughter place like theirs. Because Ashur helped them for a moment. They, they went into, sorry, they were fighting against Ammon. Ashur helped them. And because they helped them, they said, hey, go and see their slaughter place. Get, sketch, get a sketch and the design of it. Bring it. Make it here too. We'll put it next to Yahweh and we'll slaughter on that. And Yahweh used those that they had joined themselves to in falsehood and brought them back to destroy them. And take them into captivity. And isn't that what we were saying? Isn't that what people are doing today? They look to others for help that aren't in Yahweh. And when those people help them, they kind of adopt some of the things and the patterns that those people do and say, hey, but this is how I'm worshipping Yahweh. Notice when Yehuda was taken into captivity and only the poor were left in the land, etc., etc., and then even they left and what did the rulers do who now had rulership over the land? They saw, hey, but the lions and the beasts are eating up the people. And they brought others into the land to settle in the land, but then they brought false priests to come and teach the people how to worship Yahweh. So it says they feared Yahweh and they feared the mighty ones. They worshipped Yahweh. They feared Yahweh and worshipped the mighty ones of the nations. Now, you can't truly fear Yahweh when you are corrupting worship, but this is what they were doing because they were territorial. So they thought, okay, we must fear the Elohim of this land, so get some priests that will teach us how to do that, but they continue worshiping. And that's what people are doing today. They claim to be walking in the fear of Yahweh, but they're still joining themselves to corrupt ways and patterns of falsehood by using the mixing of names, the mixing of worship, that is not worship to Yahweh. So when we have this song of deliverance, we also realize 
That which we came out from doesn't save us anymore. We are not going to rely on songs that we once sang in falsehood. We're not going to rely on names that we once used in falsehood and ignorance. But now knowing the truth, we get that off our lips because that is not what saves us. And here we see the waters being made sweet at the stock called Mara, which means bitter. We see that these uh, um, waters were bitter and Moshe then were, uh, um, took a tree, threw it in the waters and the water was made sweet. We've spoken about that at length. But Mara teaches us a wonderful lesson on being on guard against bitterness. Because bitterness is a very dangerous root in people's lives. You know, so many people are still bitter over wrong relationships or bitter over wrong things that they did or things that they were exposed to as that was wrong. And that bitterness just breeds a whole lot of ugliness, you know. But when we truly are refreshed by the tree being put in the waters as a picture again of the deliverance that our master brings, the living waters, that we are to come to, to find refreshing for our beings, removing from us all bitterness, washing us from all rebellion and bitterness. Rebellion and bitterness go hand in hand, you know. In Chazon 13 verse 5 to 6, we see how the beast blasphemes against Elohim, his name and his tent, and leads the world astray to take the mark of rebellion in worshipping the beast in his image. And he was given a mouth speaking great matters and blasphemies, and authority was given to do so for 42 months. And he opened his mouth in, blasphemy, mouth in blasphemies against Elohim to blaspheme his name, his tent, and those dwelling in the heaven. So, I mean, you don't have to look too far today where the, the enemy system is clearly blaspheming the name of Yahweh by bringing it to naught, by changing it for another name, not esteeming. When you esteem the name of Yahweh, there's no other name that comes close to it or can even be used to represent it. When one gets bitter, the natural reaction is slander and rebellion and blasphemies. Yeshiyahu 5 verse 20 gives a severe warning. Woe to those who call good, evil good and good evil, who put forth darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Yaakov reminds us in James 4 verse 14, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish seeking in your hearts, do not boast against or lie against the truth. Sometimes we can't see what's in people's hearts, but if there's a motive in people's hearts for self-seeking and bitter jealousy because they don't have what others have, don't then come and lie and boast against the truth and claim that you're serving Yahweh when really what's driving you is that bitterness inside you. Then they came to Elam. Elam means palms. There was 12 fountains, 70 palm trees. Here, uh, it, was a, it was a refreshing stop along the way. Elam can also mean their leader. In Chazon 13, verse 7 to 9, we see how the world will follow their evil leader, while we, people of belief, follow our master, Yehoshua Messiah, the sovereign of Israel. In Chazon, we also see a reference to the tree of life and the 12 trees that are bearing fruit each month. We see the picture of this in Yechezkiel 47, where it speaks of the millennial rain, and on the, uh, both sides of the stream grow all kinds of trees for food. So here we see, at this stop, we recognize that as children of Israel, we are to be a refreshing supply of living water of our master to the nations. So, uh, with 70 representing the nations and 12 palm trees representing the, or 12 fountains, sorry, representing the tribes of Israel, the 70 palm trees representing the nations. This is what we have in the master. We have the source of living water that should be coming up out of us to give to thirsty travelers. What we take note, our master gives a conditional clause here. He says, if you obey me, I'll bring none of the diseases of Mitzrayim on you. Which means the diseases of Mitzrayim are still in play because the opposite is true. If you don't stay in him and don't obey him, then the diseases of Mitzrayim will be upon you. In Chazon, we're told that every disease written in this book and others that have not even been mentioned will come upon the people who do not guard the prophecy of the book. And guarding the prophecy of the book is guarding the witness of Yeshua Messiah Possessing that witness and guarding his commands. 
So we see a powerful witness here at looking at this stop where the grumbling started quickly after the praise and it was made sweet. We understand that we have nothing to be complaining about, nothing to be grumbling about. We are to be continually praising our master in spirit and truth. And blessed are those who are guarding their, command, guarding their garments, guarding the commands of our master, staying awake as he's commanded us to do so because we will see the deliverance of Elohim being made complete. By belief, we're seeing it every day of our lives. And by belief, we're giving him the praise that is due to him. And so our voice must represent the true song of praise unto our master. In everything that we say and do, it must be done in his name. Our speech and our song, I'm not adding to the word, I'm highlighting the power of it, should be seasoned with a covenant language of a people that are celebrating a deliverer who has redeemed us from the grave. Amen? Any thoughts on this chapter, the song? Song of deliverance? Are you singing that song? I mean, not you can sing the words in English, Hebrew, Greek, whatever you like to do. But even in your own life, are you echoing that Yahweh is your song? He is your strength. He is your shield. He is your deliverer. And in exalting his name, can you confidently declare that Yahweh is his name? Or you're saying, well, he knows what I call him. No, that's not confidence. That's not a, a deliverance song of praise. Amen. Okay, chapter 16. And they set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second new moon, after their going out of the land of Mitzrayim. And all the congregation of the children of Israel grumbled against Moshe and Aharon in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, If only we had died by the hand of Yahweh in the land of Mitzrayim, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to satisfaction. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to put all this assembly to death with hunger. And Yahweh said to Moshe, See, I am raining bread from the heavens for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day in order to try them, whether they walk in my Torah or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moshe and Aharon said to all the children of Israel, at evening you shall know that Yahweh has brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim. And in the morning you shall see the esteem of Yahweh, for he hears your grumblings against Yahweh. And what are we that you grumble against us? And Moshe said, In that Yahweh gives you meat to eat in the evening, and in the morning bread to satisfaction. For Yahweh hears your grumblings, which you make against him. And what are we? Your grumblings are not against us, but against Yahweh. And Moshe said to Aharon, Say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before Yahweh, for he has heard your grumblings. And it came to be, as Aharon spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness and see, the esteem of Yahweh appeared in the cloud. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, I have heard the grumblings of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, Between the evenings you are to eat meat, and in the morning you are to be satisfied with bread. And you shall know that I am Yahweh your Elohim. And it came to be that quails came up at evening and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. And the layer of dew went up, and see, on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance, as fine as frost on the ground. And the children of Israel saw, and they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moshe said to them, It is the bread which Yahweh has given you to eat. This is the word which Yahweh has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need, an omer for each being, according to the number of beings. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered, some more, some less. And they measured it, measured it by omers, and he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered according to his need. And Moshe said, Let no one leave any of it until morning. And they did not listen to Moshe, so some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moshe was wroth with them, and they gathered it every morning, each one according to his need. And when the sun became hot, it melted. And it came to be on the sixth day that they had gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. 
And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moshe. And he said to them, This is what Yahweh has said. Tomor tomorrow is a, s a rest, a Sabbath set apart to Yahweh. That which you bake, bake, and that which you cook, cook. And lay up for yourselves all that is left over to keep it until morning. And they laid it up till morning as Moshe commanded, and it did not stink, and no worm was in it. And Moshe said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to Yahweh. Today you do not find it in the field. Gather it six days, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there is none. And it came to be that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. And Yahweh said to Moshe, How long shall you refuse to guard my commands and my Torah? See, see, because Yahweh has given you the Sabbath, therefore he is giving you bread for two days on the sixth day. Let each one stay in his place. Do not let anyone go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day, and the house of Israel called its name manna, and it was like white coriander, coriander seed, and the taste of it was like thin cakes made with honey. And Moshe said, This is the word which Yahweh has commanded. Fill an omer with it, to keep for your generations, so that they see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness, when I brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim. And Moshe said to Aharon, Take a pot and put an omer of manna in it, and set it down before Yahweh to keep for your generations. As Yahweh commanded Moshe, so did Aharon set it down before the witness to keep. And the children of Israel ate manna forty years until they came to an inhabited land. They ate manna, ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan, and an omer is one tenth of an ephah. Okay, so on the 15th of the second month, so they've been 30 days since they left Mitzrayim. So in many ways, it's like the honeymoon period was over, and they once again started grumbling as they came into the wilderness of sin. And the Hebrew word they used for grumbling or murmured is lun, which actually means to lodge or pass the night or stop over. And this is a, a, a powerful picture because it's a lesson on what grumbling does for you. It actually halts your journey. You know, and there are many people today that are in many ways moping around in the dark, so to speak. You know, and so spending the night passing over this picture again of is how many people are, they're in the dark because they actually don't want to know or what they should do and what the truth is that they should follow. And Yahweh gives a very powerful test in this chapter. He says, I'm raining bread from heaven and the people will go out and gather a day's portion in order to try them, whether they walk in my Torah or not. So are people going to go out and get the bread every single day, except for the Sabbath, you know? And so the, what, this, this bread test that was given also came with the meat because most people often, when you read through this, they forget somehow, maybe traditions have caused that, that they think the quail only came later on. But the manna and the quail came on the same time that Yahweh gave as a test. Now, just out of interest's sake, the Hebrew word for manna is actually man, and it comes from the word ma, which means what. <laughs> it's like ma? <laughs> okay. So I understand why we've translated it as manna, because, you know, if we just said, you know, people went out to get man every morning, you know, it can be a bit confusing, but we understand the Greek is manna actually, but it's just why we say mana, coming from ma, it's what, ma, so the word, so it's, um, when we understand this powerful picture here of they didn't understand what this was, and our master tells us that our fathers ate mana in the wilderness, a bread from heaven that they did not know and never known before, I am that bread out of heaven. He was saying, you, these people that are carrying on with the things, they have not known me because my sheep know my voice. He is that bread out of the heaven. And we must be satisfied with that bread. Shalomo gives a wonderful parable in Mishle 30. He says, remove falsehood and a lying word far from me. Give me, my, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me my lawful bread. We understand what we are to be eating every day when we learn how to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. This is a picture of us recognizing that without the master, we have no sustenance for our beings. So we can't rely on yesterday's bread for today. 
That was the test. If you went in, everyone went out and got enough for each being. Nobody got too much. Nobody got too little. They got what would be enough to satisfy them. And anybody then that left over till the next day, the worms would eat it away. You had these worms coming. And here was the test. Why did you not eat what you should have? Why did you keep some over for the next day? Because you lacked a bit of trust that it wouldn't be there the next day? And so Yahweh tests them. I mean, after the deliverance song, they're all singing praises. And he says, no, as we go through our wilderness journey, Yahweh tests us to prove us, to see whether we are actually worthy to rule and reign with him. You know, if he puts something into our hands and we can't manage it well, how can he give us more? He will take away what we have mismanaged. And so when we see this powerful picture here of going out and getting our daily bread and clearly how many didn't listen, there are many people today that are hearing but not hearing, you know, Yes, yes, I know the word says this. Yes, yes, I know I've got to do it, but they don't do it. Yeah, I was supposed to, but. You know, we can think of a lot of things. On the sixth day, they were to gather twice as much. So that the Sabbath, they would have bread and not go out on the Sabbath and work. What did some do? They went out on the Sabbath. Once again, this was a test. This is a wonderful, power, powerful picture that we also see here as a parable of timing as well, as we understand that with one day is as a thousand to Yahweh and a thousand, a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day, which Kepha reminds us that this should not be hidden from us. We also understand that as we approach our master's day, the seventh millennium, the reign of a thousand years, we are in what you could call the sixth day, so to speak. And I firmly believe we're already entering in or possibly even entered in the seventh day. But understanding the sixth day principle before he comes to rule on that day, the gathering twice as much is that the harvest is going to be greater right before the day he comes for a harvest. That's why the harvest is plenty. We need workers in the harvest because it's a lot more than just an ordinary day through the other days of the week of creation, so to speak, the millennia of creation. One thing that's also very clear here is that Yahweh hears your grumblings. And so the manna that's fallen for them is a picture of Messiah who came on the fourth day of the week, the fourth millennium. And with them saying, what is it? They were basically saying, what are we supposed to do with this? And isn't that what many were saying with Messiah who was coming with the good news? Who are you? Don't we know his parents? Who's this one? What's this teaching that he's bringing? What is this new teaching that you're bringing? Even when Shaul went out bringing the good news, you know, to some places he went, they would say, what is this that he's teaching? Hey, let him come next week. And when he taught next week, they wanted to kill him. You know, and it, we find that, that it's sometimes it's very intriguing at first to go out and say, hey, what's this? But then when it's the same thing the next day, it's, oh, I'll leave it over, I'll get the next day. And this is what Yahweh sees. We have to be diligent. This is a test. And even our test, are you going and getting your manna every single day? You see, when we come together on the Sabbath, it's a celebration of what we've been working unto the Master with him sustaining us, now we come to rest in him with that which is a celebration of that which has sustained us, you know. And the, the bread that's prepared every Shabbat is a picture of us breaking open this Torah of instruction, the bread of life in our master as his body so that we can get nourished from the, the bits of, of bread that we're learning to get our daily bread each week and we're bringing it all together in celebration of that. And it was a responsibility of every man to get out and get for his home, you know. Some failed the test. They refused to hear God and do. Many people are failing that test today. They are failing the Sabbath test. This was ultimately the big test for people. Coming out of Mitzrayim a month later, and Yahweh is now testing their ability to guard the Sabbath. And here they didn't 
Some of them didn't. And Yahweh says, how long are they going to disobey me? How long are they not going to guard my word? You know, how long will they be stubborn? How is it that many people can be on this walk for many years and yet somehow still find themselves breaking the Sabbath for whatever reason? There is no reason to break the Sabbath, put it bluntly. There should be no reason. But this is what people are doing, you know. And so when he says tomorrow is a rest, a Sabbath set apart to Yahweh, the Sabbaths are Yahweh's Sabbaths that we rehearse as set-apart days unto him. So we don't do our weekly work, occupational work. Going out and getting bread is also a picture of going out. If you don't work, you don't eat. So it's a picture of going out and working so that you eat. If you're lazing about, the parable is very clear about the vineyard of the lazy one, you know. And it's very clear in, in renewed writings, the one who does not work shall not eat. You can't be trying to steal other people's bread because you haven't been diligent in doing what has been put in your hands to do, you know. So it's one thing breaking the Sabbath, but if in the week there's another lesson in this chapter, if you're not going out and actually working with what you should be doing, then you're also failing the test of doing what the master's commanded. Any thoughts on this passage? Um, we can we can look into seventeen or is it, we want to, any anybody want to share any thoughts? I think this is just a, a chapter that reminds us of the test that was given, and we don't want Yahweh saying over us, "How long are you going to refuse to guard my commands and my Torah?" Because whatever people are going out on the Sabbath to try and find, it's not of Yahweh. So when people think, oh, but I have to work on Sabbath because if I don't, I don't have bread on my table. No, that's, then that's not Yahweh's provision for you. Then you are working in the arm of the flesh and you're taking the mark of the beast. Who'd like to read chapter 17? It's to verse 16. It's the whole chapter. Yes, to verse 16. It's 22. And all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of Sin, according to the mouth of Yahweh, and camped in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the, the people strove with Moshe and said, Give us water to drink. And Moshe said to them, why do you strive with me? Why do you try Yahweh? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moshe and said, Why did you bring us out of Mitzrayim, to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Then Moshe cried out to Yahweh, saying, What am I to do with this people? Get a little, and they shall stone me. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Pass over before the people, and take with you some of the elders of Israel." And take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river, and go. See, I am standing before you there on the rock in Choreb. And you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people shall drink. And Moshe did so before the eyes of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Merivah, because of the strife of the children of Israel, and because they tried Yahweh, saying, Is Yahweh in our midst or not? And Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moshe said to Yehoshua, Choose for us men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I am stationing myself on the top of the hill with the rod of Elohim in my hand. And Yehoshua did as Moshe said to him, to fight with Amalek. And Moshe, Aharon and Chur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to be, when Moshe held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moshe's hands were heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aharon and Chur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Write this for a remembrance in the book, and recite it in the hearing of Joshua, 
that I shall completely blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heavens. And Moshe built a slaughter place and called its name Yahweh Nisi, for he said, Because a hand is on the throne of Yah, Yahweh is to fight against Amalek from generation to generation. So here we come to the tenth stop along the journey to the promised land called Refidim, which means rest or resting place. And it can also mean support or spread them, as we see the spreading of hands with Moshe's actions here taking place at this uh, stop. There are a number of lessons that we can learn from Rephidim. There are three things that took place around this region. The one is the water from the rock. The other is Moshe lifting up his hands and then the victory over Amalek. Okay. And then the third thing is, which we're going to look at a little bit more next week, is the advice that Yithro, the father-in-law of Moshe, gives him. So wonderful lessons. But this week we're looking at the two, the water from the rock and the victory against Amalek when Moshe lifts his hands. Now, You've got to understand the frustration, I think, here, you know. Um, they set out, they go to Rephidim, there's no water, so the people are striving with Moshe. And Moshe is saying, why are you striving with me? Why do you try Elohim? This is something that we must understand. To strive is into being contend against, to be in contention against, to, to say, no, but I'm not listening to you. Get the idea on a practical level? And those that are doing that to Moshe or to the Torah are trying Yahweh. Remember when our master was tempted in the wilderness, he told Satan, you shall not try Yahweh, your Elohim. So think about that when we bring all this together, how many people are trying Elohim when they are contending against Moshe? When they are saying, yeah, we don't need, that's what it says in the Torah, we don't need to do it. No, no, we're not going to listen. And Moshe is saying, listen, you're, you're contending with me. Why are you striving? Why are you against me? You're trying Yahweh and that's not a good place to be. You know? And in Chazon 13, verse 3, the anti-Messiah uses false signs to appear as power from Elohim, you know. And these signs and wonders is what attracts the masses. So we also see a powerful picture of this when Yahweh calls Moshe and says, take the rod that you struck the waters with, that you stretched your hand over the waters with, that opened up. Take that same rod and hit this rock. Now Moshe, I believe firmly that Moshe was, he was saying, what am I going to do with this people? You know, he was angry. So I believe he gave the rock a good smack, you know. I think he was even more angry than the next time he struck the rock when he was supposed to speak to the rock. Yahweh told him to strike the rock, and it's a picture of our rock being struck for us. So we see that. But the second time when he was told to speak to it, we see that you can't strike the rock twice. That's the lesson we get. But I do believe that Moshe was angry in a righteous anger both times. You know, the second time... He struck it when he should have spoken to, and that's what got him not him and Aharon not entering into the land. But what we see here is that this picture again of this is a clear witness of what we should not be trying to anger Yahweh or try Yahweh by contending against the clear instructions that's given in the Torah. Yahweh had proven to them that he is their provider, that he is the fighter that fights for them, that he is their deliverer. And you don't need signs and wonders to believe Yahweh. They will follow you. And when we look at this here, there are many people that are striving with Moshe, as I say, you know, and not realizing that striving with the Torah nullifies your witness of Yeshua Messiah. You cannot possess the witness of Yeshua Messiah when you're striving with Moshe, with the Torah. You know? And so we see our master being struck for us is a powerful witness again that we are to guard ourselves against quarreling, striving, complaining, and arguing. We must be encouraging one another all the more as we see the day of our master coming near. And in this chapter, then, water comes from the rock. They get this supply of water. Again, coming to our master, the, the source of living water, promises us that when we taste of that water, we will never thirst again because we know where our source is. Then comes the battle against Amalek. And as long as Moshe held up his hands, there was victory. When his hands, I mean, you can, you can see, try and hold your hands up while people are battling down there in the valley, you know. And his hands got heavy, so they got down. But then, then they saw, yo, when you let your hands down, what's happening? 
Amalek's prevailing. We can't have this. So Aharon and Hur, they positioned themselves to make sure, let Moshe sit on a rock, and they kept his hands held high. This is a picture again of us never letting our guard down in guarding of the commands, the Torah of Yahweh. You know, we are told to say to those with anxious hearts, be strong, your Elohim is coming to save you. You know, we should not let our hands or arms be hanging down, lame, you know, limp and it can't do anything. Hands held high speaks of obedience to our master. And Shaul says that he desires that men everywhere should lift up hands that are set apart. And this is a picture again of giving the proper praise and esteem to our master in everything that we do. We don't let our hands hang down in despair, in defeat. We are praising our master in everything that we do because that's when we are seeing him fight for us and we just continue to give the praise as we work unto him. Now at this event, Moshe built a slaughter place and called upon the name of Yahweh Nisi, which is a, a construct name of Yahweh declaring Yahweh is our banner or Yahweh is my banner. And a banner speaks of that which you walk under. It was the de designation or sign of the one that you walk under. Now, Ness comes from Ness, which means a standard, a sign, a signal, a, a mark, a distinguishing mark. In Tehillah 60 verse 4, it says, You have given a banner to those who fear you that it might be lifted up because of the truth. Tehillah 134 verse 2 says, Lift up your hands in the set-apart place and bless Yahweh. This lifting up of one's hands, while it was done practically by Moshe on a literal level, we understand that we don't walk around today with our hands lifted high completely and you can't do anything else. Oh, because my hands are lifted, I can't do that. No, that's stupidity. What it means is lifting up our works unto him. Does it make sense? We're not giving up. We are carrying on the fight. Amalek means dweller in the valley. And this is the fight, actually. This is the fight from generation to generation that Yahweh will defeat when he comes again. But from generation to generation, he gives a promise that a hand is on the throne of Yah. It's a recognition that the working power of deliverance is already seated as the authority that will give all those who are in him to overcome those valley moments. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm using old English. Yea, <laughs> you know, I fear no evil. Because Yahashua being in charge, the commander on the battlefield, is a picture of us being in Messiah, Yahashua, our commander in chief, who is, is in the heavens, but he's with us. He fights for us. He's in our midst. And therefore, we need not fear those valley moments because he prepares a table for us in the midst of our enemies. We can work unto him a praise that's due. We can offer up the praise to the one under whom we march, Yahweh Nisi. He's our banner. And when our master comes again, Devar Yahweh, riding on the horse, on the white horse with a banner or a sign, now this on, on, on the banner on his thigh, it's just a difference of letters. It's declaring very clearly that here's the commander coming. The word of truth. And so when we understand this, we see that Rephidim carries a number of pictures for us. It, it can speak of weak hands. And we are told that we can speak of being depleted and drained. And the lesson that we can take from this is that when your hands are weak, spread them. In other words, praise and pray and seek Yahweh, your deliverer. You know, when we're tired and frustrated, we would do best to praise and pray unto our master. You know. We have a master who fights for us. Yehoshua defeated Amalek with the edge of his sword. This is a powerful picture. It was to be written as a witness. While Yehoshua was on the battlefield, he didn't know what Moshe and Aharon and Hur were doing on the mountain. He was facing Amalek. <laughs> you know, and there might have been times where it was like, whoa, then it teaches us a valuable lesson of our intercession and prayer for one another. Because when one of our brothers or sisters are in a battle, we don't know the details, but they don't need to know. We don't go and announce, hey, I am, you know, I am praying for you. It's fine to say, like Shaul says, we, we always remember you in our prayers. That's fine. It's a, it's a reminder. But make sure when you're saying that to somebody to encourage them that you're actually doing it. 
You're not just, oh, here's a copy text out of Scripture. I'll send that to somebody, but you're not praying for them, you know. So there's a wonderful lesson here of in, your, in the valley, you can overcome knowing that you're in the master who fights for you because you continue to take your stand in him. You can not be fearing the dwellers in the valley, those that are, you know, always trying to rock you from your position. But also, we also understand in an elevated position in our master guarding the commands, a responsibility of that is to be praying for one another, encouraging one another lifting one another up, not neglecting the gathering of the set-apart ones, as is the habit of some. This is all collective in the lessons that we can learn from this victory that we have in the one that we submit to. Amen? Did you want to say something? Well, look at the map. And I know it's a little difficult because there's certain different areas. Or whatever. But if you look at Mount Choreb, I mean, at least we know where that is, and then it looks like Rafidi Masjid at the base of the mountain, yeah. where Amalek lives it's very far away yeah and for me it's just a, like a spiritual lesson and when they started grumbling against yahweh to this mountain where yahweh said to moshi you're going to come and worship on this mountain yes so but they grumbled against him and then that enemy came from a far land to come and yeah. bother them basically yeah. <laughs> yeah. i think isn't that another lesson again if you're going to grumble and moan and, and not be obedient to the master, you're going to find problems that came from, they should never even be near you. Yeah. You know, but when you stay in the master, you can have victory. Even the enemy who comes from afar, you need not fear when you stay in the master. You know, and so we can see a powerful witness here of this assurance that a hand is on the banner of Yah is a wonderful power of celebration that we can have in the master knowing that he his right hand works deliverance for us he is the master that we serve he is the one we march under he is the one the conqueror that is coming to destroy our enemies you know and he'll put all his enemies as a footstool under his feet when he places his throne here on earth that will be the complete destruction of all enemies where we will turn our swords into plowshares that we spoke of earlier. So therefore, we understand that we walk under the banner of the Most High. And in closing before lunch, I'll just quote to you the passage from 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14 to 16, which says, But thanks be to Elohim who leads us on to overcome in Messiah and manifests through us the fragrance of his knowledge in every place, because we are to Elohim the fragrance of Messiah among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one we are the smell of death to death, and to the other the fragrance of life to life. And who is competent for these? We were talking about this passage last night, death to death, life to life. The King James says death unto death and life unto life. And when you look at the Greek, it makes... It makes wonderful sense that to some, this fragrance of Messiah, we are the fragrance of death to the dying, but life to the living, you know? And the, this fragrance of death to those that aren't in the master is that which is going to lead them to death, and the fragrance of life is what leads you to a, eternal life. So we're that fragrance of Messiah, and some are going to love it, and some are going to hate it, you know? And who makes us competent for these? Chapter 3 in Corinthians 2 carries on. Thanks be to our master who gives us everything to overcome because we are more than overcomers in Messiah. And that's the lesson we learn from Rephidim. We should not try Yahweh. We should lift up hands set apart in praise to him and rely upon him. And next week, through the advice that Yithro gives, just touching on that now to just kind of bring a full circle of Rephidim, is that we need to support one another. We can't do this alone. You know? Any thoughts on this Torah portion before lunch? For those of you online, we're going to break for an hour for lunch and come back, and we're going to look at Shofetim or Judges 4 and 5 and then Matthew 5. So if you were planning to, I hope you were, that you will join us again online. I know some people sometimes only watch the morning bit, and I encourage you to join us after lunch too, so that we can collectively embrace what the Spirit's teaching us as a people together. Anything? It completes the picture, especially as we're talking about praise and celebration and overcoming and not 
You know, we're going to look at a lot of songs and praise and the blessing of staying in our master and the, and the responsibility of upholding his ways. So let's see you all after lunch. With that in mind, let's pray. Master Yahweh, we bless and praise you. And we thank you today that we can be reminded of the song of deliverance that we too are able to sing. That Yahweh, you are our song. You are our strength. You are our shield. You are our reward. We thank you that we can celebrate the victory that we have in you, that we continue to have in you, as long as we uphold your righteous right, st right rulings and standards, your Torah that you've given us as a light for our path and a lamp for our feet. We thank you that we can celebrate the ability to do this collectively as a people as we guard your Sabbaths, as we also are reminded of being guarded in our going out and coming in every single day of the week, having our daily manner, that which sustains us, but coming together on a Shabbat and guarding it as a set-apart day unto you, marking us as your treasured possession. We thank you that you've given us commands that are good for us. And I pray that we will never find ourselves in the place that our forefathers were in the wilderness, grumbling in regards to obedience to your commands, refusing to obey them. May we be a people that are diligent in guarding with all that we have so that we can celebrate you, praise you, and exalt you together. We thank you that we can share a Sabbath meal together. You are our provider, and we thank you for sustaining us and giving us breath to praise you. And we bless you and praise you and pray that you continue to let us have the privilege of being your fragrance in this world, in the name of Yahushua, our Messiah, Amen and Amen. Mm -hmm.